and start to get seated, and then we will uh, start. We want to do the rules of the road before we start taking time from the speakers. And yeah, it's good when they bring down. It's good when they bring the lights down, but then it gets dark up here. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Walter Kiefer. Um, I'm a staff scientist at the Lunar and Planetary Institute, and I'm co-chair of the program committee for LPSC. Uh, my, uh, my other session chair today is Eileen Stansbury, who is the chief scientist at the NASA Johnson Space Center and one of the chairs of the overall meeting. Um, today's session, as you know, is, in, is uh, Looking back at the 50-year history of LPSC, uh, we, we did the 50-year 50 50 50 year anniversary of Apollo this morning, and since Apollo powered the start of the solar system exploration, um, uh, we're, we're now celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference this afternoon. Uh, there's no way in any one conference that, or any one session that we could celebrate all of the highlights of the science that we've done over 50 years. And so the approach that Dave Draper and I took in putting this together was we wanted to look broadly at the solar system. Uh, even there, we could not get every object we would want in. We've tried to be judicious um, and to cover, cover big highlights. Uh, we have asked the speakers to talk about where we, where we are, where we've gotten. Some of them will make connections to Apollo. Some of them, for some cases, that's easy to do. In some cases, not so much. Um, but uh, uh, we've also asked them to kind of look forward a little bit. And so in picking people out to do this, I want to thank all of the speakers. Um, they are, they are all, all by invitation. We don't normally do that at LPSC, but this session is, is entirely by invitation. They all accepted the invitation knowing that that mean, meant that this would be the only talk that they gave at the meeting. Uh, and so I'm grateful to all of them for what they've done. Um, we, we have picked people who have been leaders in this field, but we also have picked people who we uh, see as, as the rising leaders as well to, uh, to, to be taking us to the next, uh, next level uh, when we might celebrate again at 75 or something like that. So that's the, that's the charge for the beginning. Um, uh, a few things about the rules of the road. We're going to follow the standard rules we do here. The, there'll be a nine minute uh, point in which the light turns from uh, green to yellow, and then two minutes we hope to wrap it up. Um, we hope for leaving four minutes for, for Q&A um, for each of the talks. We do have to stay rigorously on time because this room will be reconfigured to be part of the walk on the moon activity tonight, which so all of the chairs have to go out. So at 4.45, we're done in here, and everybody will have to leave. Um, and so that's why we're going to be pushy to keep everything on time. Um, the standard rules apply um, in terms of this. Microbloggers are, um, are allowed. Um, this session, unlike most of the sessions, is being live streamed, and all of the, the uh, speakers know that. And I hope they've all agreed, or at least we know which ones are not, not doing that. Um, but uh, anyway, I think that that more or less covers it. Did I get anything? Yep. OK. So um, we'll go ahead and start. Oh, and, and one last thing. If you are a speaker, when we get to near the end of the previous speaker's talk, will you please come forward and get mic'd up over on the side so we can make a very smooth transition? Um, our, uh, our first speaker is uh, Kevin McKeegan. Uh, his title is From a Sun-Kissed Moon to the Solar Nebula, Genesis Origins and Update. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for this invitation. Uh, I, I hope you all have a very good time at the 75th uh, version of this. <laughs> 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 so I'm, I am very pleased, however, to, to kick off this celebration of a half century of planetary science uh, since Apollo 11 by presenting an overview of some of the achievements of the Genesis mission. And uh, although you know, I, I was invited to do this, and you only see my, my name on here. I hope you all realize that this is the work of a very uh, large, highly skilled, and highly dedicated team. Uh, 
um, led for more than two decades now by our tireless and fearless leader, Don Burnett, principal investigator of Genesis. So here you see the, the cover page of the discovery proposal, and you see that this uh, mission is uh, about the return of solar matter to the Earth. And so um, you might say, wait a minute, I thought this was a session on planetary science. <laughs> Um, and, and also, why are we celebrating this uh, after 50, you know, 50th celebration after the landing of the Eagle? So, in fact, uh, much like our principal investigator, the roots of Genesis do go back to Apollo. And so here is a, a picture. Um, there's Buzz Aldrin with the Eagle in the background. He's just deployed an uh, aluminum sheet, uh, hanging it on this pole, uh, facing the sun to capture the solar wind. And uh, various versions of this uh, so-called Swiss flag were then on, uh, on the remaining Apollo missions up, to, up through 16. Um, and although the, 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 the exposure here at Apollo 11 was only 77 minutes on the moon, it still was sufficient to verify the concept that by getting outside the magnetic field of the Earth, one could collect particles from the sun and bring them back to the Earth in a useful way for laboratory analysis. But, you know, this limited exposure and, and as importantly, the limited purity of the targets meant that the Apollo 11 experiment really was restricted to helium and neon, all right? So it was realized, of course, that the regolith, materials on the surface of the moon, this airless body, have been exposed for vast quantities of time and therefore would capture some of these solar particles. And this, this led to uh, you know, some really profound and en enduring mysteries, actually. Um, when we now see these data, for example, for nitrogen, uh, you know, with, the, with the benefit of retrospect, we realize what we know now about the moon that is perhaps naive to think that the source of the really volatile elements on the moon, right, were only from the sun. And, but, but, you know, there were some interesting uh, uh, correlations or, or complex correlations seen between nitrogen isotopic composition, which varied a lot with the antiquity of the soil, um, anticipating genesis and some measurements of, of uh, Apollo samples made in Nancy. Um, you know, Some time after this, it could be seen that, in fact, there was more than one component of nitrogen on the moon, and there was an early suggestion for a very light isotopic composition of the planet, of the solar component. But the real reason to do Genesis was not to really understand uh, the, the issues about what's in the lunar regolith, but really uh, to, to test some of the fundamental issues regarding the assumption of what you might call a standard model of cosmic chemistry, which we've all grown up with, the view that the that the uh, the chondrites are the condensable portion of the solar nebula, right? And here, seen uh, the match between CI and solar, solar photosphere over many decades, and that this leads to then the the, the standard model that the the planets are are essentially built from chondrites and are approximately solar. And we'll hear, you know, about planetary science has to reckon with this, and we'll hear more about this. Uh, the deviations from this assumption in, in the rest of this session. But one of the other important things to realize is that even in the CI chondrites, the volatile elements are vastly depleted, right? And <clears throat> there was also an implicit assumption that was made in the standard model that with a few exceptions which were reasonably well understood, the isotopic compositions were thought not to vary um, and, and that this standard model would be true for isotopes as well as, as elements. And we now know that that's not the case, right? We know this um, for, for example, for heavy elements. We, we know nucleosynthetic anomalies, which are, however, are fairly small, but nevertheless are very well determined. But we've also known for a long time that this is not the case for major elements, major rock-forming elements, like, like, for example, oxygen, the third most abundant element. And by the way, it's 50 years since, these, uh, since uh, Allende fell 50 years ago last month, so happy birthday to Allende as well. And this is, of course, the great discovery from Bob Clayton and colleagues at the University of Chicago that there was some exotic component here, which at that time was thought to be a nuclear component, perhaps of pure O16, mixed in with these inclusions in, in the Allende meteorite. 
But importantly, this was not just restricted to, this anomaly was not just restricted to uh, you know, phases in some minor group of meteorites, but in fact exists at a planetary scale. And so what this means is that it's not possible to define a primordial composition for the major rock forming element based on analysis of meteorites or anything else that we had our hands on. <clears throat> so we know the final composition here. In order to try to understand what's causing this array, it's important to understand the starting composition. And then we might have an idea on process. So how do you get the starting composition? This is the true motivation for Genesis. All right, so the starting composition of the solar system has to be in the sun because the sun is everything in the solar system in the first approximation. All right, so by mass balance, the average is in the sun. What we think we know about the sun as it's contracting toward the main sequence, it's going to get well mixed up. So this composition of the solar nebula should be preserved in the photosphere of the sun. This is the fundamental motivation for Genesis. How do, you, how do you sample the photosphere of the sun? Well, it comes to us via the solar wind. And this was, was recognized that then if we could capture the solar wind, this would somehow be representative of this photosphere. However, there would be biases or fractionation effects in, in capturing that solar wind. And that's where a lot of the hard work comes in. So from a, from a mission perspective, it's fairly simple. You get outside the magnetic field of the Earth, cruise toward the sun, where you can execute halo orbits around L1 and go around the sun for a couple of years with the Earth, capturing the solar wind, and then bring it back to the Earth by a loop around L2. Because the fluences are very low, we're interested in the, in the, in the heavy elements. The materials have to be ultra pure in order to do this. So here's how the spacecraft would have looked at L1. There are a couple of complications having to do with these fractionations. The first is it's important to capture solar wind of different velocity regimes. And this was done with, the, with these uh, regime arrays. And then in addition, because of the, of the interest in oxygen and nitrogen that I was just alluding to, uh, uh, at, Lauren, at uh, the Los Alamos National Lab, Roger Weens led a team to build a, an electrostatic mirror, a concentrator, which would Im improve the concentration of oxygen and nitrogen by about a factor of 20 into a backward facing target um, in, in this electrostatic mirror. So Genesis mission had a flawless launch. And of course, <coughs> people, people tend to remember dramatic things. So this is what people vision and vision when they think about Genesis, at least certain people who are around. This is what happens when you drop your experiment from the top of the atmosphere. But this is not what people should remember about Genesis. In fact, what people should remember, and what I hope you'll remember, is that all the major scientific achievements were, were, were accomplished with Genesis, and that this kind of resilience is a testament to the advantages of or strengths of a sample return and also the resilience of the PI and the team and the curators and everyone else involved in this. So very quickly, I won't go through any experimental detail. Fortunately, the uh, large parts of the concentrator survived. And we were able to get a very robust signal of the solar wind. Here you see for the three oxygen isotopes a depth profile. And one was able to sputter through the solar wind to a background which was acceptably low, so we have very high signal to noise. The, solar w the concentrator is, of course, an electrostatic device, so there's going to be fractionation both in elements and in isotopes across this. And fortunately, that could be quantified by the use of neon, which could also be collect, which is abundant and is not a contaminant on the, in the atmosphere of the Earth, so it could be used to correct quantitatively this fractionation. And so that was done. And so here's uh, the oxygen isotope data. Here's the three isotope plot again, the CAI line, the TF line. Notice we're very negative values. This is uh, the, the regions of the concentrator before the mass fractionation collection, uh, correction. And, and using the neon, they all correct back to a, 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 a consistent point here at about minus 100, minus 80. And the, is this the composition then of the solar wind? It's what we collected at L1, but we know we have these biases. And so here's an, a hint to the answer. It's not. All right. And um, there are several reasons to think about that. Uh, I don't want to go through all of these uh, reasons, but I will point out that there's expectations based on theory that the, there should be a mass fractionation uh, <laughs> inherent in the acceleration of the solar wind uh, 
which if you correct for that, would put the solar value up here. All right? This is the so-called inefficient Coulomb drag model. This was supported by regime data for the noble gases, which is very important. So since we are here and close to the CAI line, and given the other uncertainties that are, are in here, we would favor putting the sun composition right here at about minus 60, minus 60, but it should be recognized that this is a hypothesis that needs to be tested. So this is a, a map then of the big picture of the solar system oxygen isotopes. Here's the sun at one end member. This is a huge line, 25% in oxygen isotopes. Uh, recently, there's been some supporting data from Lyons et al. looking at uh, row vibrational lines in the solar spectrum. I see my LED lights flashing. I need to, need to finish up. This is uh, in agreement with, uh, with our data. Importantly, the nitrogen data. All right, so in Nancy, they were able to get very good measurements of the nitrogen as well, and the, the effect is huge, almost 40% uh, depletion in the heavy isotope of, of, uh, of nitrogen. So summarizing the isotopic measurements, all the first order questions have been answered. I didn't show you noble gas, but they are. And here are the compositions. We now know that a fundamental premise of genesis that the solar wind equals the photosphere equals the solar nebula needs is not correct, and you have to pay attention to mass fractionation corrections. There are schemes to do this and, and test these models. There are some models. Magnesium isotopes would be a good way to do that. Um, so basically, the main objections are met. In the coming years, we will see work in progress on, on the harder problem of elemental fractionation and elemental abundances in the solar, so we will be able finally to base solar abundances on solar composition matter. Um, I don't have time to go into some of that, but I'll just uh, finish up with then with the, with the conclusions. And I think I've said most of these things, um, but we come back to the, to the view of the moon here because I think just as with Apollo, Genesis has demonstrated the important strengths of a sample return where you have uh, resilience, you can go to a plan B, and importantly, as with Apollo, new capabilities are coming online, new questions are being answered and addressed and by ongoing research, and thank you very much. Okay, we have time for one quick question. Okay, well then I'll volunteer a quick question. Um, so with all of this, what is the next science that we ought to be doing in this realm? Well, there are several important issues. One is to um, verify a prediction, actually, of the carbon isotope abundance. Uh, so that Lyons et al. data for oxygen depends on uh, carbon of minus 48 per mil. But I think also we're coming close to being able to do uh, elemental abundances of the major rock forming elements with low first ionization potential. So the, the issue there is that we know we have to do corrections and so one has to understand these corrections sufficiently to then backtrack from the, from the solar wind to the abundance in the photosphere. And that is ongoing work that much of it is done and just needs to be put together in a comprehensive picture. So I think we'll see that in the very near future. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, our uh, next paper this morning is the dynamical evolution and bombardment of the uh, early solar system. A few highlights of the last 50 years. Uh, Bill Bakke. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for putting on this session. It's a real honor to be able to speak here today. And I have a lot of ground to cover, so here we go. Okay. So let's start off talking a little bit. Oops. There we go. So I want to talk a little bit first about why do we think planet migration took place in the first place? And if you're clever, you'll get the hint that it has something to do with the population you're looking at right now. Okay, so back in the Apollo era, and this actually extended for a significant amount of time afterwards, we were all trying to make the planets where we see them today. But there was a fly in the ointment, and that had to do with Pluto, okay? Pluto is actually in a resonance with Neptune. It's in Neptune's two to three resonance. It can never hit Neptune, but it's also highly eccentric, and as you can see from the video, it's highly inclined. And so the question is, how in the world would planet formation processes or accretion end up getting Pluto in that orbit? And the answer to this came 
as we started to discover more objects. And it has to do with the Kuiper belt, okay? What you can see in the Kuiper belt right now is that there's numerous objects that are caught in various resonance with Neptune. And it was realized after some time that the easiest way to get that was for Neptune to enter into a planetesimal disk, migrate through it, and capture objects. So I'm gonna show you a simulation here from David Nisforti. This is a modern era simulation. What's happening is Neptune enters in, it moves, it's throwing particles all around, and it's causing it to migrate outward. And in, in, in a relatively inefficient manner, it's picking up objects and capturing them in the resonance. So that's how we got Pluto in its current orbit, along with resonant objects. But there's a key factor here. Because of the inefficiency, in order to get the current Kuiper belt we see today, we need to start with a disk which is much, much larger, at least a thousand times larger. So today we have Pluto and Eris and some very large bodies, but there had to be thousands of Plutos in the primordial disk in order to get this to work, okay? So from here, we can then do an like, if-then statement, okay? So if Neptune migrated, then we have to worry about its implications for all the other giant planet orbits, okay? So one of the big advances in doing this was the idea that maybe we have a different configuration for the giant planets to form in, okay? If we have that, then life becomes a lot easier from a lot of different fronts. So in, this so in this idea, Jupiter would be pretty close to where it is today, but Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all form much closer into the sun than their current orbits. And then out there, you have a large primordial disk of comets, which is about 20 Earth masses or so. But remember, the goal is, is we have to get to the current system where we have maybe a Mars mass of comets out here and the planets all spread out, okay? So this was work that was done by a team of people in Nice, so they call this model the Nice model. The giant planets form on circular orbits. There's a large massive disk. You can see the disk is losing mass. And in this simulation, there's a giant planet instability, which means giant planets enter into this uh, disk and the whole system goes into a new, into a new end state. But this instability is, um, let's say, this instability, the timing of it, of when it happens, isn't known, okay? At this simulation, it was tied to having hundreds of millions of years take place before it takes place. Now, the one thing that's nice about this model is it does a really great job of reproducing the orbits of the giant planets in semi-major axis, inclination, and eccentricity. And if you follow up on all the, all the sort of lines of evidence for this model, it does a really nice job of giving you a, Kuiper, a good Kuiper belt. It gives you the regular satellites of the giant planets. It gives you the Trojan asteroids. It does a lot of interesting things to the asteroid belt, which we think explain observations. And it goes on and on. It's a very interesting and powerful model. And right now, it's the only model we have that can explain this huge suite of constraints. Okay. So what other evidence do we have for planet migration? Well, in fact, the actual mass of Mars may be telling us something about migration, okay? And by, I mean by small Mars here is that Mars isn't the size of Earth or Venus. It's not like a huge terrestrial planet, it's a small one, okay? So if you go to sort of standard planet formation models that people have used over, let's say, years or even decades or so, and you assume the solar nebula is acting in a well-behaved manner, like what we call a minimum mass solar nebula, what happens, a lot of these simulations end up with Mars, Mars results, which are way too big, okay? You can see Mars way down here, but a lot of the simulations are up here. And that mass difference has always been sort of problematic. What are we missing? What's, what's going on? Now, there's different solutions for this, and I'm only gonna suggest two here that are related to migration, okay? One is called the Grand Tack, and another one I'm gonna talk about in just a second is the idea that an early giant planet instability took place. So let's first talk about the Grand Tack, okay? So the Grand Tech takes advantage of ideas that when you're forming Jupiter with a core and it's accreting gas, if it gets massive enough, it can interact with the gas disk and it can migrate, okay? So I'm gonna start a simulation here with the idea that Jupiter is actually migrating with the gas disk and it's gonna migrate inward across all of these planetesimals, which in this case, we're just gonna assume are like S types, but there's really more types represented here, but let's just assume that for the moment. Okay, so the simulation will start. Jupiter begins to migrate inward. Okay, and Saturn is actually growing as well, and because for various reasons, Saturn as it grows, actually grows, get, uh, migrates faster, it gets caught in a resonance with Jupiter and Saturn, and then the ensemble, Jupiter and Saturn, interacting with the gas disk, causes it to migrate back outwards. So this does a couple things. First of all, it truncates the inner disk, so all of a sudden you have less mass available to make your Mars, which is good, now we have a way to make a small Mars. The other possibility that's really neat here is you're taking objects which are carbonaceous in the outer solar system and you're embedding them in the asteroid belt. And this, when it first came out, seemed like a crazy idea, but now the meteoritic evidence is pointing in directions that maybe most of our carbonaceous materials actually start beyond Jupiter and they're actually residents of the giant planet zone or the primordial disk. It's very exciting, okay? Okay, so 
we have, but now we have a new player on the scene, and this has just happened. It's really exciting, a really exciting work. And this is the idea of this, right? So the problem with the Nice model so far is getting the delay. Can you get hundreds of millions of years in? And so some, some new work uh, pioneered by Clement et al. has suggested that maybe the instability happens very early. That's much easier to handle dynamically. So what you're going to see here is a planet formation simulation where the, where the Nice model instability happens at a very short time in, maybe about 10 million years in. So here you see the giant planets forming, and you see the planetesimals. You're going to see the instability start here in a second. Okay? And then when it goes, all of a sudden you see you have this extra level of excitation that's put into the inner solar system. You manage to eliminate a lot of mass near Mars, and so that would also be able to give you a small Mars. On the left, I'm showing a simulation of what we think the initial conditions might be like, and you notice that a planet gets lost here. In some of the most recent simulations of this nature, we actually lose a Neptune-sized mass, and that actually seems to be something we have to have to explain various constraints, so that's all interesting. But if this early instability model is right, then our ideas about how dynamically, when do we get the moon formation event, and how early bombardment should go, they all have to be strongly affected. So this is the new, new kid in the block that we have to investigate. Okay. So now I'm going to briefly turn and talk a little bit about bombardment. And I'm just going to focus on lunar bombardment because there's just too much to cover here. And in fact, I thought about giving a little bit of a history on this, and that would be fun, but there's no time. So I'm just going to have to give you a sort of a summation of what's going on. Okay. So there's been, so I would say right now, based on Grail data, based on the classic Don Wilhelms group and all the people from the Apollo era that did geologic mapping, there's of the order of about 40 basins on the moon. And it you know, could be 45 or whatever, but you know, it's of that order. And a basin is defined as a crater larger than 300 kilometers. Now what's interesting is that two of the three largest basins are also among the youngest, okay? Imbrium and Oriental. Imbrium is maybe the only one we have a good age for, okay? There's arguments about this, but ultimately we think Imbrium is about 3.9. And Oriental we don't have a sample age for, but we know from various stratigraphic reasons and everything else, it's younger. It's maybe 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. Okay, beyond that, the age constraints are very limited, and there's been lots of arguments, decades of arguments about this, but most of the basins we thought were well dated in the past are now more suspect, so we'll see what happens. Now, what's interesting is there's been brand new work by Alex Evans and his team with uh, Grail data, and they've been looking at 90 kilometer craters on the moon. These are uh, craters that you could see, even in Grail data, even if they're hidden under the mare. And what they find is the spatial densities of these 90 kilometer craters for Crisium, for Serenitatis, for some other basins are just about the same as Imbrium. And that suggests they may have formed at very similar times or have similar ages. So we don't know what that means in terms of, of the dynamical situation, but it does suggest some big things were happening fairly late on the moon, which is interesting all by itself. Okay. So here's the problem we face that everyone in the lunar community faces. Okay. So if you want to understand early bombardment, if you want to, if you want, let's say you think it's a cataclysm, okay, or let's say you think it's a declining bombardment, or let's say you think it's some kind of interesting hybrid. All of these problems, you're up against the problem that we probably don't have any terrains dated that are older than about 3.9 billion years ago. Okay, we sim all the samples we have from the near side, from the Luna and the Apollo spacecraft, just sample a fairly narrow window in time, and we're not getting the ancient terrains. Okay, that's a big problem. So if we're going to make progress, we definitely need to get older terrains. Okay. So where would we go to get the older terrains? There's, there's different ways to answer this, but I'm going to advocate one of the best places to go would be the lunar far side. We know from geologic mapping, we know from grail data, that's where the old stuff is located. The oldest basin by superposition on the moon, and also the biggest, is South Pole Aiken Basin, but we don't know its age. Okay? It's all we know is it's older than Imbrium, it's older than 3.9 billion years ago, but we don't know how much older. Okay? We also now, from Grail data, have this fantastic data set of, of 150 kilometer craters all across the moon. This is a sort of a summary of Greg Newman and his team and all the things they've done. Okay? But we still have a problem. Even though this is the oldest terrain on the moon, the issue is, when did time for basins start? Okay? Are we looking all the way back to the formation of the moon in four and a half billion years ago? Or did the moon somehow completely resurface itself at about the time where we're seeing a lot of interesting sample ages at about 4.35? And that answer is critical, because if we don't have that, we can't solve planet formation. Okay? We need that as a constraint. So that's a big deal. Okay, so I'm going to try to suggest something here just for fun, just to kind of put some things together. So if you take the far side basins and you look for those that are the, where the craters are the most spatially dense, and you just use those, okay, you can come up with a size distribution. So this is a size distribution of the 150 kilometer craters, and you can combine that with some very old predectarian craters that are a little bit smaller. And you can get a, and what you get from that is a slope, power loss slope that's about a minus two. 
Okay? That could represent saturation. I, I have some arguments as to why I don't think it's saturation, but it is a possibility. But what's interesting about a minus two is it doesn't actually fit the asteroid belt very well. What it does seem to fit in an interesting way is it actually fits the size distribution we're now finding out for the Kuiper belt and maybe the primordial disk. Okay? We have a minus two that goes way out into, uh, into fairly small sizes. So it, this could be a suggestion that we had a comets hitting the Earth, uh, excuse me, a comets hitting the moon very early. Maybe this is a suggestion that we actually have to have an early giant planet instability. Okay, and I'll just conclude on this. Here are some problems I think are really important to work on. First of all, understanding the early instabil instability models is a big deal because we need to know what the comet contribution is. We also need to know what the contribution is from planetesimals that are left over in the terrestrial planet region. And finally, if we really want to probe the earliest times of, of the moon, what we need to understand is this population of basins which are viscously relaxed that formed in a very hot crust. There's been some really nice work done by Conrad et al. recently, but I think there's more that could be done with this using the GRAIL data set. And I'll stop there. So thank you very much. We have time for several questions. What sort of an event would be big enough to trigger a mass migration of the giant planets, uh, interstellar planet of really large size coming in like Uma Uma that came flying through last year? What would have caused that? Well, okay, so, so in, the, in, in the Nice model, what I refer to, what's happening is that your, your primordial disk, which is 20 Earth masses, in some cases is losing mass. And, if it, and as it loses mass, it's causing Neptune to migrate ever so slightly because the particles are interacting with Neptune. And eventually you can reach sort of a point where Neptune can actually enter into the disk. And at that point, it migrates through very quickly, throwing mass all over the place. And so that's the trigger for the instability. It could also be that you're trading angular momentum with the planets in this ensemble of the disk. There's lots of different ways to do this. But it turns out keeping that disk stable for a really long time is a tricky issue. It's much easier to have it go unstable. And that's why these early Nice models are starting to get very interesting. Anything else? Okay, thanks, Bill. Thank you. Oh, sorry. There's one coming up. Sorry. Oh, okay. So, multi grid party JPL. Uh, I have been uh, thinking about these comets and asteroid bombardments you talked about in the last slide. Uh, do they, when you said that uh, they could be actually the outer. Uh, objects like you know the uh, uh, KB wall type objects which are pushed inside, so the composition can be the same, irrespective of uh, whether they are asteroids or comets, except perhaps their speed of bombardment, right? Yeah, I mean it's the issue is you have you have sort of three possibilities for bombardment populations. You have comets, you have asteroids, and, and leftover planetesimals. Comets we think have a different size distribution than asteroids and leftover planetesimals. Asteroids and leftover planetesimals may have the same size distribution. We're not sure. Okay, so they might be identical. So that's, that's an issue that we, that we love to explore in more detail. And we need geochemical constraints on all of this to see whether it makes sense. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Bill. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker, um, the next talk is by Solomon, Nittler, Anderson, and Byrne. The talk is First Rock from the Sun, 50 Years of Mars Exploration. Sean Solomon is the speaker. Thank you, Walter and Eileen. My colleagues and I are uh, proud to represent the students of uh, the first rock from the sun in this historical perspective. Uh, where do I point this thing? There we go. 50 years ago, we had no spacecraft data from Mercury. Uh, we had only astronomical observations limited to mass, radius, and some orbital characteristics. Um, nonetheless, a distinguished, uh, very distinguished, uh, Cosmochemists could deduce from that limited information that Mercury had a much higher mass fraction of iron than any other planetary object in the inner solar system. It took uh, the Mariner series and Mariner 10 to uh, give us the first spacecraft uh, observations of Mercury. Mariner 10 was launched in 73 and flew by Mercury three times in 74 and 75. Mariner 10 discovered that Mercury had uh, an intrinsic magnetic field. Uh, Mariner 10 uh, discovered that inside the magnetosphere there are bursts of energetic particles. Uh, Mariner 10 made the first measurements of Mercury's uh, very tenuous atmosphere or exosphere, uh, in particular the abundances of hydrogen and helium, uh, both uh, ultimately derived from the solar wind. 
Uh, Mariner 10 imaged a little less than half of the planet, uh, roughly a kilometer resolution on, on average, so, so some images at better resolution than that. Uh, and it, it came at a time after the Apollo missions, and so the, our, our understanding of the geology of the moon uh, greatly influenced the early work on the interpretation of the geology of Mercury. Uh, I, I point in particular to the work of uh, Paul Spudis and John Guest, who worked out the stratigraphic history of Mercury uh, by extrapolation from the moon, and that, that has guided us uh, from that original work. Um, but uh, uh, Apollo missions also gave us some debates and some misleading information because of the expectation that the outer parts of, the, of Mercury would were probably similar uh, to the outer parts of the moon, and that turned out not to be the case. And we had a long-standing debate over the origin of Mercury's smooth planes and whether they were uh, like the lunar Maria, which they were stratigraphically, or like uh, lunar light planes, uh, which Apollo 16 had visited and was, of course, in place as fluidized ejecta rather than as volcanic material. And that debate uh, ran on until we sent the next spacecraft mission. Uh, a long time elapsed, and what we learned about Mercury over that interval came again from planetary astronomers who detected additional species in Mercury's exosphere, notably including sodium uh, depicted here and potassium and calcium at abundances far too high to be from the solar wind. They had to be from the surface, although the, there was an unknown contribution to each from impact vaporization, so we didn't know how much of it was from uh, Mercury surface material. Astronomers also detected in the early 90s and announced the discovery of mercury polar deposits uh, in the permanently shadowed regions of impact craters at very high latitudes of the North and South Pole, postulated to consist of water ice on the basis of radar characteristics and predictions for the temperature at the surface in, in those areas because of the limited uh, uh, atmosphere at mercury. To, uh, Go to Mercury with another spacecraft really took the discovery program in the early 1990s, which enabled uh, PI-led missions that were capped uh, in cost and launch vehicle and development time. And in three uh, successive opportunities for the discovery program in 94, 96, and 98, a total of five different missions to Mercury were proposed. Uh, they were proposed by three different spacecraft centers. They involved multiple flybys. They involved orbiters. Uh, and in the end, uh, the messenger mission was selected in July of 1999. Uh, messenger was developed. Messenger launched uh, in 2004, had six planetary flybys, three of Mercury, which returned data, and then went into orbit around Mercury in 2011 and took orbital data for a little over four years. So what were the discoveries from this uh, discovery program mission? I'll just summarize a few of them, uh, but I'll pause long enough to say that our very first data uh, were presented at this meeting uh, a few months, just two months, after the first uh, Mercury flyby in 2008. Uh, we got a lot of surprises from the composition of Mercury. One of them is that Mercury, uh, in con contradiction really to the predictions of a lot of uh, hypotheses put forward to explain the high metal fraction of the planet, uh, is a volatile rich world. And there you see uh, a plot of, of potassium and uh, chlorine uh, normalized by other elements uh, and illustrating that uh, Mercury is as volatile rich with respect to those elements as Mars, considered a volatile rich planet. So it tells us that Mercury broadly was formed from materials similar to those of the other planets, but retained or, or captured uh, more volatile materials than, uh, than perhaps even Earth and Venus. The surface of, chem of, of Mercury is chemically heterogeneous. We learned that from mapping with X-ray and gamma ray spectrometry. Um, we inferred on the basis of photogeology and other uh, rules of inference that most of the surface units on Mercury are volcanic in origin, but they do vary in elemental composition. And uh, geochemical and petrological modeling using those compositions uh, reached the result that the, uh, they must be the product of variable partial melting of a chemically heterogeneous uh, mantle beneath the crustal layer.
Also, uh, Mercury is a highly reduced world. The uh, absence of iron in silicates, the low iron abundance on the surface for an iron-rich planet, uh, and the high abundance of sulfur in the silicate fraction all point to highly reducing conditions for the materials out of which mercury formed, much more reducing than that for the materials out of which the other inner planets formed, particularly Earth, uh, Mars, and Venus. Mercury turned out to be a, have a carbon-rich surface, uh, and that came from a mix of observations, uh, including spectral reflectance and, and particularly including uh, neutron spectrometry. Um, but it was predicted. It was predicted in a wonderful paper by Van der Kaden and McCubbin in 2015 that in a magma ocean on Mercury, uh, having a bulk a silicate fraction matching that of the surface composition, uh, the only mineral to crystallize in such an ocean and be buoyant and float would be graphite. And so they made the prediction that there might be remnants of graphite uh, that could be seen at the surface. And uh, a year later, uh, the thermal neutron results for, uh, from Poplowski and others uh, bore that out. So uh, Mercury is darker than the moon. It's darker, we think, because of the graphite. The graphite is concentrated in some of the darkest material on Mercury's surface and probably is remnants, uh, consists of remnants of that original flotation crust. We confirmed that Mercury has a magnetic field. We confirmed uh, with Messenger that the magnetic field, like that of the Earth, is, is largely dipolar, but unlike uh, the field of the Earth, the dipole is not centered at the center of the planet. Uh, it is uh, aligned with a spin axis, even better than uh, the Earth's field, um, but it is offset from the uh, center of Mercury by 20% of the Earth's radius. This is a summary by Catherine Johnson and colleagues of all of the data from the MESSENGER mission at various distances from the planet of the magnetic equator uh, on the left and of the uh, dip axis of the dipole on the right, indicating largely axially aligned but substantially offset dipole, not predicted by any dynamo model prior to the mission. Uh, as the uh, MESSENGER mission uh, came into its last year, the periapsis altitude dropped lower and lower to, to the surface, and uh, we were able to resolve, again, some work of Catherine, led by Catherine Johnson and others, crustal magnetic fields. Uh, that couldn't be seen at higher elevations than about 100 kilometers, uh, but showed the behavior as a function of altitude, indicating that uh, these fields were crustal in origin. Uh, they tended to be higher in amplitude in uh, some uh, areas that were broadly associated with smooth planes. Uh, and so we think that these represent the product of an ancient dynamo operating on Mercury uh, between 3.5 and, and 4 billion years ago. Tectonically and volcanically, Mercury is a world that has been dominated by interior cooling uh, to a degree that is less evident, is more evident on, on this body than any of the sister planets. Uh, it, the amount of contraction uh, was seen from Messenger to be greater than, than resolved uh, by only Mariner 10 data and began to match the predictions of thermal history models. The last uh, large episodes of effusive volcanism were confined to uh, periods on Mercury's history prior to three and a half billion years ago, uh, most readily explained by the continuing horizontal contraction of the lithosphere, which tended to make magma ascent much more difficult. Nonetheless, Mercury is an active planet in the geologically recent past and perhaps even today. Uh, there's evidence from uh, the tectonic features from the work of Maria Banks and, and uh, Tom Waters and others that some of these tectonic features fault uh, tiny, very young impact craters implying a very young slip on some of these fault systems. Uh, and Mar uh, Messenger discovered that uh, there are landforms known as hollows uh, marked by uh, depressions, uh, absence of rims, irregular outlines, uh, surrounding halos for most of them uh, that uh, appear preferentially on one particular spectral unit and are interpreted in terms of loss of some volatile uh, bearing material uh, in response to Mercury's surface conditions. And these must be fairly recent because 
at the highest resolution of the very uh, best images of these features, there are no impact craters superposed. Lastly, the uh, polar deposits uh, were imaged directly uh, using uh, uh, high exposure uh, images uh, looking into the areas of permanent shadow, demonstrating that at the highest latitudes, the polar deposits were bright at optical and near infrared wavelengths. Uh, and they were bright in areas where the temperature models calculated from insulation using measured topography predicted that surf, uh, water ice would be stable at the surface. But a major discovery was that the polar deposits farther from the poles are dark. They're dark at optical and near infrared wavelengths. They're darker than any other mercury uh, surface materials. Uh, and they point to some other uh, vol uh, volatile material, some other ice, uh, some mix of materials, because they seem to be stable to higher temperatures than water ice, but a variable temperature. And they're postulated to be organic uh, compounds, probably complex organic compounds, delivered to mercury by the same objects that delivered water ice. The next 50 years has begun in the exploration of mercury with the launch last fall of the Bepi Colombo mission involving two spacecraft that will arrive at mercury 50 years plus uh, after the last flyby of Mariner 10. So uh, if we have a meeting in 75 years, I hope we will be discussing the results of Bepi Colombo and more missions that will be launched uh, between now and then. Thank you. Okay, we have time for some questions. Or not. <laughs> okay, then what is the next most important uh, um, uh, scientific measurement or anticipated discovery? I don't want to undersell Bepi Colombo. Uh, it's a dual spacecraft mission uh, with a 16 instrument uh, payload between the two spacecraft uh, that has uh, enormous capabilities. Uh, particularly, uh, we'll be acquiring data at uh, much higher resolution in Mercury's southern hemisphere than, than uh, Messenger did. I want to, before I answer your question, mm -hmm. uh, give a shout out to the need to discover meteorites from Mercury. Mm -hmm. I think the meteorite community, if, if uh, they can be encouraged with support from NASA and other agencies to uh, redouble their efforts to find new classes <laughs> of meteorites, um, it would be wonderful to, to find meteorites that look like the materials on the surface of Mercury. And the orbital dynamicists who study this problem say that the odds are good that a population of meteorites equal to our collection uh, should have some from Mercury. But the final answer to your question is, what would I do after Bepi Colombo? Mm -hmm. I would send a lander. Good what? I would land a spacecraft on Mercury to uh, test using ground truth the composition of the surface the composition of volcanic materials, uh, the composition of low reflectance material, the composition of polar deposits. That's more than one landing site. I'm not sure how you do all those. <laughs> but I'll leave that for the team of that wonderful mission. <laughs> OK, thank you. All right, our, ne our next paper is The Exploration of Venus, Current Understanding and Open Questions. Uh, Bern et al., paper being given by Bern. Thank you. Can you all hear me? OK, so um, first off, on behalf of my co-authors and myself, thank you very much for the conference and program chairs. It's my great pleasure, with no little bit of trepidation, to talk to you about the entire planet Venus. And in the next 45 minutes, is that how long I have? <laughs> I'm going to try and convince OK. Challenge accepted. OK, so I'm going to try and condense some of the greatest hits for what we know of planet Venus, some of the perhaps more surprising things we learned over the last 60 years of exploration of that world, and perhaps some of the things that we might consider doing next. Your favorite fact or discovery or, or niche thing about Venus may not feature in this. My apologies. You're free to cost me in the, in the corridor afterwards. But I want to share with you some of the most exciting things we know about Venus. And, and I'm also largely pitching this, this talk to people my age and younger who might not know that 
we used to study Venus a lot, and it is a fabulously interesting world. I'm not here to advocate it over any other world in the solar system, but it really does deserve our attention. So this is the legacy of Apollo session. So it's worth talking about Venus in the context of what we've learned from Apollo in the last 50 years. And it's worth pointing out that about a month before Kennedy gave his impassioned we choose to go to the moon speech, not very far from here, the previous month, Mariner 2 had already left Earth for Venus. So we were exploring Venus as a, as a proper cosmological body long before we ever put human beings on the surface of the moon. And it's interesting to look at the history of exploration of the moon. This is a set of, this is the number of missions per decade flown, or at least intended to be flown to the moon with the explicit goal of studying the moon, not flybys or anything else like that. Not all these missions succeeded, but this is the number that was planned and flown by human beings or attempted to flow. Some of these things exploded on the launch pad. But the point is, this is a history of lunar exploration. There was a lot in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It kind of went away in the 80s, and it's been coming back since then, and that's really cool to see. And we saw some really exciting results this morning. It is worth pointing out, for those of us who might not remember that far back, that something similar was true for Venus. That from the 60s and 70s, there were 28 missions, 35 right through the 1980s. And then the number of missions, this is not including missions that were using Venus for a gravity assist, for example. These were missions dedicated to study, to fly by, to orbit, to land, to float through the atmosphere. These are the missions that were sent to Venus. And for those of you in the back, there's a load of them here, except that number goes about to zero in the 1990s and onwards. The last mission the United States flew, for example, to Venus with the sole purpose of studying Venus was the Magellan mission, which lifted off in 1989. There have been two dedicated Venus missions missions since. One is still operating. Both focus on looking at the atmosphere. They've discovered a great deal of really interesting things. But it's been a long time since that golden age of Venus exploration happened to take place. Now, what's interesting about Venus is that it is an Earth-sized world orbiting a fairly common kind of star in, depending on your take of conservative or optimistic, the habitable zone of that star. So if you're a squiddy alien 80 light years away and you're looking at your squiddy tentacles and you're pointing your telescope at our solar system, you're going to see two worlds that appear to be, in terms of mass and radius, very similar. But we both know these are not similar worlds geologically, chemically, physically today. But some of the most important things to point out is it really is quite similar to Earth and what it's built of and where it is, which, which implies at least that they had very similar constructional histories. So the stuff they accreted from, probably similar with all the attendant implications for chemistry and volatile inventory therein. In 1962, from the Goldstone antenna on Earth, we determined that Mercury or that Venus uh, experiences a retrograde or a rotation. It goes around the wrong way around its axis relative to, to where the other worlds in the solar system do. And the flyby of the Mariner 2 spacecraft in 1962, the first successful interplanetary flyby was to Venus showed us that there are very high temperatures in the lower atmosphere, which put pay to any idea of Jules Verne's jungle-like world, you know, warm and tropical humid. No, we knew there was extremely high temperatures in the lower atmosphere, and there was no resolvable magnetic field, which led to its own set of questions. Why a world so similar to ours in probably composition, but certainly in size, density, why not have a magnetic field? We learned that the atmosphere of Venus is by turns both hospitable and lethal. We know that it's about 97% carbon dioxide. There's a very high deuterium hydrogen ratio in the atmosphere of Venus, detected by two complementary, uh, two, two complementary measurements from two different missions, which at least imply that, at least if Venus started off with a similar uh, amount of water as Earth did, Venus has lost a huge amount of water over its history. Because the DDH ratio, there's some uncertainty in the measurement. It's almost 100 times greater than modern day measurement for Earth. And we know that the atmosphere is super rotating. We know that there's a global cloud layer that's composed of sulfuric acid clouds. But we know that that cloud layer is not geologically stable over the 100 million year time scale, and so you need to be replenishing the stuff that goes into making those clouds, water and sulfur, on geologically recent time scales to produce and to continue to maintain that global cloud layer. Here's an artist's impression, not a photograph, of the Vega 2 balloon floating serenely, because this is the cool thing. At about 50 kilometers above, 50 to 65 kilometers, the ambient Pressure and temperature conditions in the Venusian atmosphere are almost identical to this room right now. It's 97% CO2, so you'll asphyxiate pretty fast, but you won't be boiling to death, which is in strong contrast to what's happening on the surface, because Venus is basically hell made real. Again, this is not a photograph, this is an artist's impression of what the Venera lander is sitting here. This thing is probably still sitting there today, because the pressure isn't actually that big a deal for the electronics, it's the temperature. But we know from these landers that the pressure is about 93 bar, and that the temperature is self-cleaning oven. So that really poses a challenge, not just to operating uh, electronics in the surface for any extended period of time, but also for what that means for the chemical reactions with the surface. However, we do have some in situ measurements of the composition, and we know that, generally speaking, most of what these landers saw was something that approaches a basaltic lithology. 
These are basically kind of mafic stuff, and we see that all over the inner solar system. We see that on Mercury, we see it on Mars, we see it on the Moon. And the Venera 13 and 14 landers are amongst the two, if not the only two spacecraft that ever returned images of the surface themselves. They also photographed, at least at one of the sites, what looked to be almost sedimentary like rocks. Now, they're not laid down in the presence of water necessarily, but it looked like compacted material, some kind of ash perhaps, or some sort of fine grained material eroded off the highlands. But it doesn't really look just like what we would see, Pahoy Hoi lava we've seen, for example, on Earth. We also have the first recording of sound from another planet, from one of the Venera landers. Interior. It's a world without modern day plate tectonics. But on the basis of the chemistry and arguments for its internal density, this world is differentiated. It likely has an iron core. It likely has some, something approaching a peridotite mantle. We know from observations from the Magellan spacecraft and others that there are at least some volcanic regions that correspond to upwellings, so deeply compensated uh, high standing terrain that might imply some kind of upwelling. We know that in some of the lowlands, at least, they happen to be uh, associated with geoid lows, which might imply some sort of mantle downwelling, some kind of vigor, some kind of convection taking place in the Venusian mantle today. And from Magellan gravity topography data, we know that at least in some places from the near global image and topographic data, that there are some high standing areas that may not be supported from below. They might be isostatically compensated, right? So they might be fairly thick and they're sort of sitting there quite happy. And we know of at least one kind of terrain on Earth where that happens. I'll come back to that point. So that's some of the kind of vital statistics of Venus. These are just some of the surprising findings. And when I was preparing this talk, I polled my co-authors to ask their opinion, what did they think was one of the most interesting things we learned in the last 55, 60 years of exploration of Venus? And repeatedly, the same thing came up. Venus has a weirdly and unexpectedly young surface. The Magellan spacecraft, which really was and is the only data set we have that gives us global coverage, although I want to point out, global image coverage, radar image coverage for Venus is 75 meters per pixel. That's better than Viking or Mach. That's, that's better than the global data we have for Mercury. There's a huge amount of untapped stuff in those data sets. Now, the topography is not so great, but there's a lot of really good efforts to try and improve that. But the point is, we have a surface of a planet three times more than all the land surface on this world. It's right next door. But what we saw from mapping those data, even early on, was that there's only about 900 craters. There's no craters fewer than three kilometers in diameter, or less than three kilometers in diameter, and there's a dearth of craters below about 25 kilometers in diameter. That means there are no calorises. There are no South Polic and basins or imbiums. There are no Hellases or Argyres or Utopias. We, in fact, the largest basin, the largest crater feature, impact feature on Venus is Mead Crater, about 300 kilometers in diameter. We also see that the distribution of these craters is indistinguishable from random. That doesn't mean that they're randomly distributed. It means we don't see an obvious clustering of these craters in different places. We don't see ancient crater terrain on Venus in the way we see the crater terrain on Venus or on Mercury, or we see the lunar highlands, or we see the southern uplands on Mars. We don't see that on Venus. And that has led to the interpretation generally fairly widely shared that volcanic, re volcanic resurfacing somehow, in some manner, has been important to the geological history of Venus. Another surprising finding, and this given to us by the Venus Express spacecraft, an ESA mission that operated through 2006 to around 2014, I think. Venus Express detected transient hotspots that would change of the order of a few days. It also found evidence of high emissivity that could be, on the basis of an argument for how uh, rocks are chemically weathered on the surface of Venus, could correspond to relatively young or recently in place lava flows. It doesn't necessarily give us a unique handle on how young they are or how old they are, but it does say on the basis of the emissivity that some of those flows are resolvably younger than the terrain that surrounds them. We also saw with Venus Express temporally variable SiO2, or sorry, yeah, SO2 in the atmosphere, not SiO2, it's a different question. Sulfur in the atmosphere. At the high atmosphere, we were seeing the amount of sulfur in the atmosphere changing. Now, I mentioned earlier that that global uh, sulfuric acid cloud layer has to be replenished with water and sulfur to get those clouds created. And maybe this is a testing of some kind of process in which sulfur has been degassed and released into the atmosphere. And it raises the question of whether or not there's active volcanism on Venus right now. And one more surprising finding, and we saw this in the, talk, in the sessions this morning for Venus, there is indirect evidence that perhaps Venus is a more dynamic and perhaps mobile world than we experienced, than we, we might once have thought. There's evidence on the basis of some of the, the images, the radar images that Magellan returned, of tectonic deformation of a style that really is resolvably different to Mercury, to Mars, to the Moon. In fact, the level, the amount of deformation, the amount of strain in each area is comparable really only to Earth. There are systems here, there are structures that really are best explained by stuff moving side by side of orders of a few tens of kilometers, and we do not see that type of deformation on the other inner solar system worlds except this one, which might attest 
with a lot of their lines of evidence that stuff has been mobile across the surface of Venus in the geologically recent, or at least as recorded by the surface features today. So what are the, some of the open questions? What did early Venus look like? On the basis of the D to H ratio and the implication, the inference, that a lot of water was lost from the uh, Venus system, Mariner 5 and Pioneer Venus suggested that perhaps there was a humongous amount of loss of atmospheric water. And it raises the possibility that perhaps within the last billion years, Venus had much, much more water than it does today. It doesn't uniquely mean that it had oceans, but it might suggest that perhaps Venus was much more of a water world than it is today. Is there continental crust? There are some high standing areas I mentioned earlier that are thick, that are isostatically compensated. We know that from some of the data from the Venera 8 lander that there are at least evolved rocks. It's not just all mafic stuff on the surface of Venus. We know that in some of the tesserated terrain, which is a type of distinctive kind of, 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 of landscape that's highly tectonically deformed, it looks like really highly deformed continental interiors on Earth. And locally, these things happen to be the stratigraphically oldest stuff. Are these some kind of continental crust? And were there two Earth-like worlds at some point in solar system history? Was there a point in time where if you're that squiddy alien from 80 light years away and you visit our solar system, would you have seen two worlds that looked like this? Do they have a shared geological history in which they would have started off similar because they start off with the same kind of inventory of chemicals? If they didn't, what does that mean for how stuff accretes in the solar system in general? And if they did, if they have that shared history, when did their paths diverge? And you go from one world to the other. So where do we go from here? In the last 30 seconds, I'm going to simply say that we need much more data on the composition and the evolution of the atmosphere. We need to know about the composition of the surface materials, particularly that upper material. Measuring its SiO2 content might simply tell us quickly, in the case of an hour of operations on the surface, whether that stuff is actually continental material or not. We need to know what the structure and any presence of activity is for the interior of this world to know, is it as dynamic as our observations of the surface are beginning to suggest it might be? It's pretty important that we understand Venus in its own right, because when we study Mars or Mercury, we don't say that we're studying this just to try and understand some other world. And that's often the narrative for Venus. Venus is worth studying in its own right because it's a fabulously fascinating world. It's right there. However, it is also worth understanding Venus because we have an Earth-like world right next door. And understanding it will help us understand what the similarities and differences are with the other rocky worlds in the solar system and more broadly, those rocky worlds in orbit around other stars. And for those of you who are microblogging, that's a 69 character long uh, conclusion right there. Venus will help us understand the rules that basically govern and shape Earth-like worlds. Hashtag thank you very much. We have time for probably one question. That's a great question. No. Thank you so very much. The question is, uh, last week I happened to be looking at one of the Venera 13 pictures. And uh, as an atmospheres person, maybe you can explain, rather, I'm an atmospheres person. Maybe you can tell me, why is there sand? Uh, short answer, my views do not represent those of my employers, my co-authors, or the uh, people here in the room. But it's very possible that if you're basically eroding stuff off the highland terrain, that stuff is going to form small particles that will be carried into the topographic lows. That's what those things touched down. So they might be seeing the protolith could be whatever the hell the highlands are made of, but we're seeing material that's eroded down and deposited in those lows. Okay, we need to move on. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. The next talk is by Schmidt, Hurd, McCoy, McSween, Rogers, and Treeman. It is Igneous Mars, Crust and Mantle Evolution as Seen by Rover Geochemistry, Martian Meteorites, and Remote Sensing. Marie Schmidt will give the talk. Thank you. Thank you. It is a real honor to be able to represent Igneous Mars at this session. Um, I could not have done this, could, could not have put this talk together without my very excellent co-author, so thank you for that. Okay, so uh, Mars has experienced a prolonged igneous history, and that has been indicated by uh, its geomorphology. And so the uh, Mars geologic time scale has been, um, uh, it's been constructed based on crater counting and the geologic principle of superposition. And the, the earliest part of Mars history, the pre-Noachian, saw the development of the large features on Mars, including the buildup of the bulk of the Martian crust, as well as the development of the dichotomy between the southern highlands and the northern lowlands. 
as well as the onset of Tharsis volcanism, which has continued through much of Mars's geologic history. So with time, uh, Mars experienced con uh, continued planetary cooling, uh, thickening lithosphere, and stabilization of convective upwelling beneath Tharsis. So the goal for this talk, or the question for this talk, is how do orbital, meteorite, and land admission data sets provide insight to the igneous evolution of Mars? So let's start from orbit. Uh, re uh, remote sensing and uh, uh, orbital missions have uh, provided gamma ray and infrared global data sets, um, such as this, uh, these mineral maps provided by Omega. And uh, collectively, these indicate that the low dust regions of Mars are basaltic, and there are 10% or on the order of 10% regional mineralogical variations in plagioclase feldspar, uh, low calcium pyroxene, high calcium pyroxene, olivine, as well as uh, poorly crystalline materials that are likely secondary. The potassium and thorium abundances have been found to be higher than the meteorites, but with a similar potassium thorium ratio. So the Martian meteorites, um, there are over 120 Martian meteorites that have been linked to Mars based on shared geochemical characteristics. And these provide really important uh, uh, information about the bulk composition of Mars and isotopic evolution. Uh, these include the uh, alkali poor basalts, the shergatites. Uh, these are 165 to uh, 600 million years old. There are two meteorites that are, uh, that are called ajate basalts. They are chemically distinct, a bit older, uh, 2,400 million years old. And then there are co-magmatic co uh, ultramafic cumulates, the noclites, which are clinopyroxenites, and uh, chastignites, which are dunites. These are about 1,300 million years old. And, uh, but in reality, nearly all of the Martian meteorites are Amazonian-aged, alkali-poor, mafic to ultramafic rocks, igneous rocks, and we call them the SNC meteorites. I plotted them on a, a total alkali versus silica diagram, which is very useful for, uh, for constraining uh, uh, volcanic rock compositions. And I'm going to gradually fill in this diagram as I go through additional uh, geochemical data sets. There are a couple other meteorites of, uh, that are very important and worth noting. Uh, the ultramafic cumulate, ALH84001, which is low in total alkali. It's a plus down here. Uh, and then there are, there's a group of regolith preches, NWA 7034 and all of its pairs. Um, it's been called black beauty by some in the, in the uh, meteorite community. And uh, some class and zircons within this regolith preche uh, are as old as 4,400 million years old, and the breccia itself, though, it yields about 1,500 million years ago. Okay. Um, oh, and, the, and this uh, regolith breccia displays a range in silica and in total alkalis. Okay, land emissions. Um, the alpha particle X-ray spectrometers have been flown on four successful rover missions. Uh, these provide geochemical information in context, and it also allows us to make uh, direct comparisons between the different landed sites, uh, landing sites. So the, the Pathfinder mission in 1996 deployed the Sojourner rover, and it analyzed basaltic soils as well as uh, rocks that are uh, a bit richer in silica than were expected and are thought to have possibly been altered. The Mars exploration rovers include the Spirit rover, uh, which explored the, the a goose of crater, it, it uh, encountered basalts that are subalkaline to alkaline in composition and likely Hesperian in age. Um, and then the Opportunity rover uh, examined one igneous rock over its 15 year uh, time, and uh, that's the bounce rock, which is actually very similar in composition to the uh, sugar type meteorites. Um, Keep going. Okay, the uh, Mars Science Laboratory rover Curiosity uh, has been actively exploring Gale Crater, which is a, a largely sedimentary environment. But uh, early on in the mission, the rover encountered some igneous class and float rocks, uh, including the Jake M class, which are very rich in sodium. Um, they were first uh, classified as being Mujerites by Stolper et al. Um, but uh, in a recent paper, I've uh, looked at, uh, I've corrected for the dust and found that uh, it's, it ranges from phonolite to tracheandesite and composition. 
Uh, and then the, the uh, Curiosity rover is also examined relatively unaltered basaltic uh, sedimentary bedrock, which uh, the range in potassium is thought to reflect source characteristics. Okay, so what do we know about Mars? Um, the bulk composition of Mars has been derived by uh, the SNC geochemistry and has been corroborated by remote sensing observations as well as rover geochemistry. Overall, the bulk composition of Mars is very similar to that of the Earth. And this is a plot uh, from Banky and Drivis uh, where we're looking at mantle abundances relative to silicon and C1 chondrites. Okay, but the, one of the big differences, there are differences, of course. The first is that Mars is more enriched in volatiles, including alkalis. The second is that Mars is also less depleted in oxygen, fugacity, sensitive, moderately siderophile elements. And this reflects a higher oxidation state during core formation processes. Um, collectively, these differences are probably a, a, a consequence of uh, Mars's greater distance from the sun than the Earth. Okay, so uh, the early Mars, there is generally a general consensus that Mars experienced uh, an early magma ocean, and this is based on short and long-lived radiogenic isotopic characteristics of the Martian meteorites. Um, the various isotopic systems uh, summarized in this figure uh, tell a story of, uh, of accretion and core formation, magma ocean differentiation, atmospheric degassing, uh, crust formation, all by about 40 million years ago. Associated with uh, magma ocean differentiation and by about 25 million years ago uh, is the, uh, was the formation of discrete mantle reservoirs. And I've represented this in a plot of length and maturbium ratio versus log oxygen fugacity for the sugar type meteorites. Okay, and these range from depleted in uh, light rare earth elements and reduced to intermediate to enriched and oxidized. The overall range in, uh, in uh, oxygen fugacity um, is consistent with oxygen fugacity estimates for the Gusev basalts. The uh, diversity of the earliest Mars crust is very well represented by the NWA 7034 and its pairs. Um, the class within this uh, include igneous impact and brecciated uh, lithologies. There's uh, basaltic, uh, thuleitic to alkali basaltic compositions, basaltic andesite, tracheandesite, as well as an iron titanium and phosphorus rich lithology. Zircons within this, um, within this meteorite have been found to be quite ancient, including one in an alkali rich class, which is uh, 4,400 million years old. And this confirms ancient alkali magmatism on Mars and is consistent with uh, alkaline compositions seen by the, the Spirit and uh, Curiosity rovers. Um, the, overall, the petrogenesis of this meteorite and its pairs uh, has been dominated by water-poor, impact-generated, episodic lithification. And uh, that culminated in a thermal event um, at about 1,500 million years ago uh, that led to brecha lithification. Okay, so over time, the history of Mars has, or the, the interior of Mars has continued to evolve. Um, so from the Noachian into the Hesperian, there is a decreased abundance ratio in uh, low calcium pyroxene to uh, um, low calcium pyroxene plus high calcium pyroxene. And that's represented in this histogram comparing Noachian and, and Hesperian terrains. This uh, shift in, calcium, in uh, pyroxene uh, composition is consistent with lower degrees of partial melting and is caused by a, a cooling mantle and thickening lithosphere. Uh, in addition, uh, over the same time, there is a decreased uh, potassium as well as thorium abundance uh, as represented in this histogram. Uh, the the uh, incompatible element, so this is consistent with incompatible elements concentrated in first mantle melts or uh, possibly contamination by earliest Martian crust. Uh, from the Hesperian to Amazonian, there's also a change in composition of the rocks. Uh, so there's a lower silica and higher thorium, as well as a, uh, a tendency toward uh, lower iron among Amazonian terrains. And this led uh, Barito and others to model uh, 
uh, higher pressures as well as uh, lower degrees of partial melting among the Amazonian, uh, uh, Amazonian terrains. And this is consistent with uh, continued mantle cooling and lithospheric thickening. So the, the Mars has a thick lithosphere. lithosphere. Uh, the consequence of this is that it has slowed cooling, it's stabilized convection, as well as uh, preserved ancient heterogeneities with respect to the distribution of light rare earth elements, alkalis, volatile, volatiles, and oxygen fugacity. The variability uh, seen in the uh, uh, in the geochemical data sets is presented here uh, giving ranges in uh, potassium titanium ratios um, and uh, so the, the, the uh, sugar types uh, have these very depleted compositions that we do not see among the landed data sets and that's probably a consequence of our tendency to send rovers to older terrains, Hesperian Noachian terrains. Uh, in addition, there are these very uh, these significant enrichments in potassium relative to, ti to titanium um, within the noclites, the uh, Gusa basalts, as well as in Gale Crater, and uh, this is likely uh, caused by some sort of an enrichment process that has um, um, possibly caused by metasomatic fluids in the Martian interior. Okay, so in, uh, in addition, um, uh, rare feldspar-rich crustal lithologies have been identified from orbit uh, as well as in Gale Crater. Um, and uh, these have been taken as evidence of ancient continental crust. Uh, so uh, the, the feldspar-rich lithologies may instead be anorthosites or fractionally crystallized basaltic magmas. Um, and there's really no need to invoke repeated assimilation and fractional crystallization as is essential for continental crust formation. Okay, so just to summarize, um, the evolution of the Martian mantle and crust is pieced together by multiple types of data sets. Orbital missions provide infrared and gamma ray global data sets. Meteorites provide detailed mineralogical, elemental, and isotopic data sets, but they lack context. And then rovers provide uh, geochemical data sets with context. Uh, altogether, these tell a story of an early Mars magma ocean and associated planetary differentiation that uh, led to the formation of de discrete, depleted, and enriched mantle reservoirs. With time, the, uh, the planet continued to cool and the lithosphere thickened, causing lower degrees of partial melting and greater depths of melting. While the early crust was lithologically diverse, uh, the Mars crust is generally basaltic. Rare feldspar-rich lithologies are likely the product of fractional crystallization of basaltic parents. And given the scope of this, uh, this session, I think it's important to link our desire to collect and return samples from Mars to Apollo. Apollo demonstrated the immense value of samples collected with context. So well-characterized igneous materials from a not yet sampled period of Mars history, such as the Noachian or Hesperian, would yield uh, really important insights to the mantle state and composition at that time and contribute to our understanding of the long-term petrological and geochemical evolution of the planet. Thank you. Okay, either one very, very <laughs> short question or none at all, because we're about on schedule. Okay, thank you. Our next talk is uh, the sedimentary history of Mars as observed by rovers. Rampy, Arvidsson, Edgar, Edget, et al. Uh, being given by Liz Rampy. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. And uh, I'm just really excited to talk to you guys about the uh, uh, sedimentary history of Mars, uh, especially early Mars, so early uh, Noachian, late Hesperian, so around three and a half to four billion years ago. So we can think about sedimentary systems, whether they're on Earth or they're on Mars, in this source-to-sink framework, uh, where weathering and erosion in a source area creates sediment that tells us about the provenance, tectonism, and paleoclimate. 
Uh, the sediment is uh, then transported during which mixing, sorting, and alteration occurs. Uh, it's there, the sediment is transported into basins uh, uh, in which uh, diagenetic reactions occur, like the dissolution of minerals and the precipitation of new minerals. And then on Earth with plate tectonics, much of this sediment is recycled. So the sedimentary cycle on Earth is, is an interplay between plate tectonics and mountain building events. Uh, the emission of greenhouse gases from volcanism, which uh, 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 helps raise the temperature of the surface and also produces things like CO2, which produces carbonic acid and helps with the weathering of rocks. And also an active hydrologic cycle, uh, which helps transport uh, weather and erode materials. The sedimentary cycle of early Mars was a little different than that on Earth because we don't see uh, uh, evidence for robust plate tectonics on Mars. Uh, uh, so there wouldn't have been these orogenic events like we see on Earth. But still, impacts in volcanoes uh, generated differential topography. Volcanism emitted greenhouse gases, which raised the temperature of, of, the, of the surface to that of the triple point of water, so that liquid water could flow across the surface. Uh, uh, and then uh, these uh, materials in volcanic edifices or in crater rims would have been eroded and transported by fluvial or aeolian processes and then deposited in some sort of sink like impact basins. The importance and diversity of sedimentary processes on early Mars was really recognized from orbit with the Mars Orbiter camera uh, on Mars Global Surveyor. And this figure is from Malin and Edget. It just shows a variety of layered sedimentary rocks across the surface of Mars. Uh, the high-rise camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, has also produced some just astounding images of alluvial, fluvial, and lacustrine deposits across Mars, including this layered fan deposit from Caprati's Chasma. And if you want a little eye candy, I suggest reading uh, Bayer et al., 2012. They show some just jaw-droppingly gorgeous images from high-rise of sedimentary rocks on Mars. And the secondary mineralogy, or the, the minerals that form from water-rock interactions, are also a really important part of the sedimentary history, because they can tell us about the aqueous conditions to, under which sediments were deposited, lithified, and later altered. And a variety of secondary minerals has been uh, uh, discovered from orbital infrared spectroscopy, uh, including phyllosilicates, or clay minerals, which are denoted in blue, and sulfates, which are in pink. And in general, phyllosilicates are found in, in slightly older terrains than sulfates. And in, in, in some places on Mars, we find phyllosilicates uh, directly underlying sulfates in some sedimentary sequences. And so this led to a, a model of the aqueous evolution of Mars, uh, in which the uh, clay minerals formed during the Noachian under alkaline conditions. And then there was this great uh, burst of volcanic uh, activity, which caused a global climate change on Mars, uh, acidified uh, surface waters causing the precipitation of sulfates, after which the Martian surface dried out. And then our observations from rovers actually allow us to introduce complexities into this model of Mars's acidification and aridification, and shows us that the uh, sedimentary history of early Mars actually varied in space as well as time. Uh, much of the landing site selection for rovers on Mars has been driven by morphological and uh, mineralogical evidence for past aqueous activity. So the Pathfinder rover landed in Eris Vallis in 1997, which is an outflow channel, and it studied flood deposits. Spirit landed in Gusev Crater in uh, 2004 because of orbital evidence for this channel entering this crater, uh, suggesting there might be ancient lacustrine deposits. Uh, Spirit didn't find those ancient lacustrine deposits, but found some silica sinter, suggesting hydrothermal fluids were moving through here. And actually, this outcrop on the right almost brought us back to Gusev Crater with Mars 2020. Opportunity landed in Meridiani in 2004 because of uh, evidence for abundant hematite from thermal infrared uh, uh, orbital data. And on the surface, it found that this hematite was present in spherules or blueberries, suggesting deposition in water. And Opportunity has studied some uh, magnificent 
sedimentary exposures in crater walls, uh, including perhaps the most uh, famous sedimentary exposure on Mars, an endurance crater of the Burns Formation, which uh, was deposited around uh, early, uh, early Hesperian late Noachian. Uh, Opportunity studied uh, the Burns Formation in, in Erebus and Victoria, and then studied some layered Noachian materials uh, of the Matijevich Formation on the rim of Endeavor Crater. These materials are fractured and show evidence for luminous phyllosilicates suggesting uh, uh, groundwaters moved through here. And so this seven meter exposure of, of the Burns Formation in Endurance Crater is so well preserved that it allows for some very detailed sedimentological analyses. So there's a lower unit that is characterized by a large scale cross bedded sandstone, which is consistent with an Aeolian dune field. Uh, a middle unit that's characterized by uh, 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 cross stratified or, or low angle cross stratified sandstone that's consistent with an Aeolian sand sheet. And then there's this upper unit that has some low angle cross strata, but also some planar laminations, some uh, uh, wavy bedding, and also some evidence for soft sediment de deformation, which is consistent with a mixed Aeolian and Playa environment. So here there's evidence for this uh, gradual drying or, or wetting over time, uh, whereas in Erebus there's the opposite, a change from a wetter to a uh, drier environment over time. So that might preserve an entire climatic cycle. I will note that there are alternative hypotheses to explain the deposition of the Burns Formation, which include uh, impacts and volcanism. So finally, Curiosity landed in Gale Crater to study these layered uh, sedimentary rocks at the base of Mount Sharp because from orbital evidence, they show that there, is, uh, 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 there are secondary minerals like hematite, phyllosilicates, and sulfates. And so Gale Crater is one of these places on Mars that preserves that mineralogical stratigraphy with phyllosilicates underlying sulfates. And so with Curiosity, we can drive up those strata and study this uh, uh, inferred global climate change that happened in the early Hesperian. Uh, from the ground, Gale Crater is just a, a sedimentologist paradise. Uh, I'm, a member, oops, I'm a member of the uh, 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 science team, so I'm just gonna take you on a tour of the Traverse and show you some of these sedimentary rocks that we've seen uh, that tell us about depositional environments in Gale Crater about three and a half billion years ago. So this is our traverse uh, from our landing site on the plains to where we are today on the lower slopes of Mount Sharp. We've gone uh, a little over 20 kilometers in the last uh, six and a half years. Close to our landing site, we found conglomerate and mudstone as part of the Bradbury group. We also found some sandstone strata that were dipping very gently towards the center of the crater at a place called the Kimberley. And then we, we started driving up, when we started driving up those lower slopes of Mount Sharp, that's when we first started studying the Murray Formation, uh, which is what we're still in today. It's dominated by mudstone. Some of them are, are thickly laminated, so centimeter scale laminations, uh, but much of it is thinly laminated with millimeter scale laminations. And so with, with all of these observations, we can come up with a depositional model uh, for early Gale Crater. Uh, there would have been streams emanating from the rim, depositing conglomerates that we saw in the plains, uh, where these streams enter uh, lakes on the crater floor. Uh, that's where uh, delta deposits would have formed, and those dipping sandstone strata of the Kimberley are, are consistent with uh, uh, prograding delta deposits. Those mudstones uh, represent lacustrine deposits. Uh, those thickly laminated mudstones would have been deposited closer to shore, thinly laminated mudstones uh, further from shore. This red line represents our traverse where you can see that we started off in fluvial lacustrine or uh, fluvial deltaic deposits but really have been skirting a lake margin for much of the mission. And we've driven through uh, about 400 vertical meters of, of stratigraphy. And this stratigraphy suggests that there was a persistent lake environment that lasted for upwards of 10 million years. Okay, so the chemical and uh, uh, mineralogical observations, uh, along with uh, the observation of diagenetic features, can really help flesh out what these ancient sedimentary environments were like. Uh, so the observations from Meridian, uh, uh, from uh, Opportunity and the Burns Formation suggest that aqueous fluids were diverse and there were multiple fluid episodes. There are abundant evaporites like sulfates and chlorides uh, suggesting uh, acidic groundwaters with high ionic strength. Uh, 
The texture and the composition of these hematite-rich spherules suggests deposition in oxic groundwaters. And the observation of crystal molds is consistent with the dissolution of pore filling cement during late diagenesis. And one of the greatest advancements in our understanding of alteration and diagenesis at Gill Crater has been quantitative mineralogy with the Chemin instrument, which is an X-ray rectometer on MSL. So these are pie diagrams that show you the uh, relative mineral abundances for all of the fluvio lacustrine samples that we have drilled to date. Uh, I'm going to just point out just some of these mineral groups that tell us something about uh, alteration and diagenesis. In black is magnetite. Red is hematite. This transition from hematite or uh, magnetite-bearing sediments to hematite-bearing sediments suggests a change to more oxic aqueous environments over time. Uh, calcium sulfates are in yellow. Uh, the abundance of calcium sulfates uh, at the top of the section suggests that this part of the stratigraphy uh, um, uh, experienced sulfate-rich waters. Uh, and jarosite is in purple. It's an iron sulfate that forms under acidic conditions. Uh, but the most important thing about this jarosite in a, in a sample called Mojave II is that potassium argon dating from the SAM instrument suggests that is only 2.1 billion years old. These sediments were deposited three and a half billion years ago. So there is evidence for a history of liquid water that might have spanned one and a half billion years at Gale Crater, which is so important when we're trying to constrain habitability. Finally, the, these pie diagrams aren't telling the entire story because all of these samples have 15 to 60 weight percent X-ray amorphous materials. Now, this is an ongoing dilemma for us because on Earth, X-ray amorphous materials tend to mature to more crystalline phases like quartz. So we don't see that at Gale Crater. So it suggests that uh, uh, although we see a history of liquid water that might have spanned a billion years, it was likely intermittent rather than persistent. So when we compare the Burns Formation from Meridiani to the Murray Formation in Gale Crater, uh, we see that they were deposited around the same time, uh, and both require sustained liquid water to form, but they experience very different depositional and diagenetic processes. Burns Formation was deposited in a mixed playa aeolian environment where very saline groundwaters altered it whereas the Murray Formation was deposited in a dominantly lacustrine deposit where these lake waters and groundwaters were variably oxic, but we don't see nearly the amount of sulfate that, that is present in the Burns Formation. So these differences suggest that sedimentary environments on early Mars really varied over space and relatively short periods of time. Uh, Curiosity is going to continue to uh, investigate these uh, mineralogical variations in units that we've identified from orbit uh, that have clay minerals and sulfates. So it'll be really interesting to compare uh, the results from the sulfate bearing unit to what's present in the Burns Formation. And I'll end uh, uh, by talking about the Mars 2020 rover <laughs> uh, offers us another look into the early Hesperian. So it's landing in Jezero Crater, uh, which is the site of Delta deposit. From infrared spectroscopy, these deposits have phyllosilicates and carbonates, but very few sulfates. So we might expect that these results from 2020 will add some more complexities into our ideas and hypotheses of early Mars. Thank you. It has to be very, very quick. Oh, um, I'm terribly sorry uh, to ruin the, the news, the, um, uh, the dreams of the sedimentologist, but uh, I, I then found uh, uh, the olivine that is unaltered in all the places. So, uh, given that olivine alterates in uh, less than 100 years. So how can you explain millions of years of water in these places? Yeah, so actually, it's interesting. Uh, we do think that, all, uh, especially down at the base, where we do find minor amounts of olivine that is significantly lower than uh, uh, the inferred basaltic progenitor. So we do think that olivine has altered in these sediments, uh, probably to the smectite. But in this part of the section, we don't find any olivine. But there's plenty no, of olivine I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but yeah, we, no, do, sorry. we don't have time for any yeah, follow-ups. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. you.
Okay, our next talk is by Raymond Russell and Castillo Roger, uh, Ceres Investa, Diverse Enigmatic Small Planets from the Dawn of the Solar System. Carol Raymond is the speaker. Thank you, Walter. Um, thank you uh, for the invitation to speak. I'm delighted to be here to talk about Ceres Investa, the results of the recently uh, uh, completed Dawn mission. Um, so I, I have probably as many slides as Bill Bakke could uh, could present, and I'm going to try to do my best to get through them all. Um, at, let's see if I'm up to it. So um, let me uh, just give you briefly what the motivation for the Dawn mission is, and as I go along in the talk, I will be making the um, connection to the Apollo era. Um, I think this was a mission that probably wasn't on the radar screen uh, during that time, to go visit um, small bodies outside the, the orbit of Mars. Um, and the, the motivation for this mission really wasn't to, to look at small bodies, but it was to go back in time and understand the role of size and accretion time in, and, um, and the differentiation and interior evolution of bodies that would come together to form planets and other um, uh, bodies in the solar system. Um, also, what was the role of initial composition and the accretionary environment in the uh, outcomes that we see today. Uh, and finally, how did impacts uh, change those bodies uh, into uh, the, the, the ones that we see today? So this was the main motivation for the mission, and, and Ceres and Vesta were the targets because they, were, um, they had the ability to really give us uh, two end member data points of, of what this population of, of early farming bodies um, were like. So the other um, important thing about Vesta, of course, is it's the source, or was thought to be the source, of the Howard I. Eucrite Diogenite series of meteorites, and uh, stimulated by the return of Apollo samples and, and studying the moon in the context of these samples, a program was initiated to look for connections between meteorites in the or a collection on Earth and, um, and asteroids. And so um, John Adams, Tom McCord, and Torrance Johnson started this uh, survey to match telescopic spectra with the spectra, reflectance spectra of meteorites in the collection. And um, very early on, they made a confident match to Vesta. And here you can see um, the, the reflectance spectra from um, Eucrites and Diogenites and uh, the telescopic spectrum of Vesta. So that was um, a, a really early and important discovery. And then they didn't find any other confident matches um, in the collection. So that uh, told us Vesta is fairly unique and also an important target for exploration. And more importantly, um, we can see that we have more material from Vesta in the meteorite collection, uh, vastly more than we have from the moon or Mars, even including Apollo samples. So we had an opportunity to really um, make a, a, a great leap forward in, by understanding the context of where these samples came from in kind of a reverse sample return mission um, um, fashion. And so the combination of all, of all the things we've learned from the HEDs and the ground truth from Dawn have really made Vesta the best known planetary body aside from the moon. And there are nice um, comparisons that one can make between the two. So let's um, look at these two bodies that, that changed from being smudges, even um, with the most powerful uh, telescopes we have. This is from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, we changed from uh, looking like this into um, a, a real geological world uh, with um, complex geology, tectonics, and, um, and very steep and very steep topography, uh, as well Ceres, which looked like this in the best um, Hubble data, uh, is, is also a very complex world um, beyond what we had initially imagined it to be because we knew it had um, a high volatile content from its density and, and therefore might have a very icy surface more akin to um, uh, Europa. So I just want to um, leave that there for just a moment, sink in um, how, how far we've come from not really thinking about going to these bodies um, in the Apollo era 50 years ago to, um, to being able to study them 
in great detail and really understand fundamentally how these planetesimals, protoplanets, dwarf planets um, formed and evolved and what implications that has for um, the early solar system. Okay, so what did we know and what did we learn? We confirmed Vesta began volatile pore, that it fully differentiated igneously, and it is the HED parent body. We also found that it formed from volatile depleted material. So it started out dry. Um, it had a complex magmatic evolution and created volatile rich material that was delivered by impactors. For Ceres, we confirmed Ceres is volatile rich. It's partially differentiated, which was a, uh, a prediction made by its shape, and that experienced global aqueous alteration. There were um, early uh, indications that the surface of Ceres uh, contained carbonates and other products of alteration, including ammoniated species. And we did learn uh, by direct um, observation that Ceres is ammonia and carbon rich, and uh, while similar to a CI chondrite, it's not a match. Um, also, very surprisingly, that it has recent brine-driven geologic activity. So now I'll, I'll, I'll look at each in, in turn. Um, Vesta, we have three uh, lines of evidence to show uh, the match between Vesta and the HEDs. The uh, band centers of pyroxene uh, are shown here in the gray cloud uh, against the measurements made in the laboratory based on the HED meteorites. Uh, we also have the same um, match between elemental abundance ratios and the gamma ray neutron uh, measurements from Vesta shown in the ellipses. Um, and then finally, the core size that we were able to infer from Dawn's gravity and topography constraints is consistent with that which was predicted based on the HED um, models of Vesta's differentiation. So we also found, we, we knew ahead of time from, um, from Hubble and other telescopic observations that there was a giant impact basin in the southern hemisphere of Vesta. And we found that indeed um, that was true, but there were also two basins, um, the Venonea being the older and then the giant Rhea Silvia basin. Um, these excavated deep into Vesta's interior, but we, um, in contrast to expectations, did not see olivine, which we expected based on kind of the layer cake differentiation model. Um, we also determined by the age of this and uh, age of the basin, and um, its consistency with the uh, inferred age of the Vestoid population that the Rhea Silvia impact is likely the source of the, the main source of the meteorites that we have in our collection. So we, we did also uh, essentially find the smoking gun for the HED Vesta connection. Now it's also known because there was so much study of these rocks in the lab that um, that there were variations in the collection which weren't consistent with a global magma ocean or a, a consistent um, magma composition. And so this was, could be explained by having a heterogeneity in the um, magmatism and the possible, uh, but, but also left open the possibility that there were multiple parent bodies for the HEDs. Now melting models predicted there was no magma ocean, so that would be able to explain that variability. Um, and then uh, the last, or the most recent model, um, posits that Vesta started with a magma ocean phase of equilibrium crystallization and then transitioned into a, a mode where the fractional crystallization within late stage magma chambers took place. So we were able to test these different hypotheses with our data. And here um, you just see in these two plots from from the gamma ray neutron data and the, um, the IR data, the distribution of diogenite in the warm colors and eucrite in the, uh, the cooler colors. And what we can see here is there's, there's a preponderance of diogenite in uh, certain areas of Vesta. And it's also where we see the only occurrence of olivine that we can identify on the surface um, in, in any uh, strong concentration. Um, and also, we can see that the density of the crust um, indicates that we have denser material closer to the surface here, and the, the correlation between this density map and the distribution of diogenite is indicating 
uh, or is favoring that model where we have these late stage plutons intruding into the crust. So we've been able to, to really learn something about the, um, the, the magmatic evolution. Now I'm going to move really fast. We also found hydrogen on Vesta, both in the gamma ray and the IR data. And we can um, correlate that with impacting carbonaceous chondrites, whose clasts are showing up in um, howardites. Uh, we also see it in the, the dark material that's, um, that's cropping out in the crater wall of Marsha Crater. And in the floor of Marsha Crater, we're seeing these uh, pits which are associated with volatile release and are similar to the pits on Mars. So, Ceres. Um, Ceres, in contrast, did not igneously differentiate. It underwent ice rock fractionation. We believe it started out um, almost uh, as early as Vesta, but its volatile content allowed it to, um, the internal temperature to be moderated such that it, it didn't heat up to the point where the, the silicate um, melted entirely. So we have an altered composition and a partially differentiated interior. The crust is composed of a mixture of rock, ice, salts, and clathrates. It is not dominated by ice and is rather strong. But below that layer, there's a, a, a brine-filled pore layer that is controlling the global shape. We, can't, um, we cannot rule out the possibility of a dehydrated core. And the surface is showing us that the that, that Ceres has had a very complex or, or a, a chemically uh, evolved um, process uh, of alteration leading to the uh, surface being dominated by ammoniated clays, serpentine and carbonates as predicted um, by the telescopic data. Um, but also we found the presence of sodium carbonates and ammonium salts and it's really important that this is only the third body in the solar system in which we see this uh, chemistry and the others being the plumes of Enceladus and then hydrothermal areas on the Earth. So we also detected organics at one location, but we um, associated with a, a very specific color in the framing camera data. But we, um, we do have some other indications that it might be more uh, diluted over the surface, especially because the surface is very carbon rich. So this is a cartoon just to show you um, Ceres started out volatile rich. Um, there was melting of ice, um, a pulse of serpentinization. Then we ended up with a differentiated structure with a primitive ice shell. We've now um, eroded that ice shell off, garden, impact gardened it, and now we have a, 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 a surface which is, is quite complex and also where the volatiles are being remobilized by impacts to create um, the, the surfaces that were, uh, the, the activity that we're seeing today. So my last few slides here are going to show the, the examples of these, these recent um, brine-driven geologic features. The, um, the most uh, famous one is Ahuna Mons, which is a constructional feature uh, created with of sodium carbonate. It's fairly recent. Um, yet the abundance of salts across the surface, um, a similar composition indicates that um, these, these salts are in, uh, abundant in the near surface. And of course the, the facula in Akatur Crater and in other craters are also um, showing us that we have um, some very uh, recent and ongoing activity. And I'm going to, I really want to show you this movie so I'm going to jump to that, and then I will make a few um, summary remarks. Um, okay, so I'll tell you what. I will say that I will take questions now while people watch this, if you like, because um, I think it's um, one of the, the most important products that we've gotten from our last phase of the mission where we got super high resolution data, and you can see how it um, is uh, changing our understanding of, oh, well, I just cut it off anyway. <laughs> so I will um, I'll now get off the stage by uh, making <laughs> my, my last comments, which um, are that we, we learned a great deal from the study of these two objects about um, the, the population of planetesimals. And I'll thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
Okay, our next talk is uh, going to be the exploration of Jupiter uh, with Fran Bagenal. Thank you very much. So my enormous task is to review the past 50 years exploration of 71% of the mass, of the planetary mass <laughs> of the solar system. So um, what I'm going to do is start with what we knew about Jupiter before Apollo and uh, move forward. Of course, we knew uh, Newton calculated that uh, Jupiter is 300 times the mass of the Earth and about uh, 10 to 12 times the size. So we knew it was a big gas giant planet. Uh, and we've been observing it from the ground ever since um, uh, Galileo and, uh, and before, of course, but with telescopes after Galileo. And we can see things with ground-based observations of the weather. Uh, and indeed, before Apollo or the era of Apollo, um, we could get measurements of the composition. Uh, here we have ammonia and methane and hydrocarbons detected uh, in addition to the hydrogen and helium that we know about. But what's also interesting is that at the time of 1969, we only knew of 11 moon moons of Jupiter. Uh, and of course, we knew there was something funny about Io, this uh, weird little behaving uh, moon was appearing to brighten up after an eclipse, which had some suggestions about maybe there could be something like frost on the surface. Now, also, this little uh, bizarre, pugnacious moon uh, triggers radio emission. And we knew this back in 1955 or so, when the radio emissions were first detected. And they seem to be correlated with the position of Io telling us that there seemed to be some electrodynamic coupling between this moon and the planet Jupiter. And around the same time, in the late 50s, early 60s, was the discovery of radio emission at decimetric wavelengths that told us that here we have a planet with a very strong magnetic field and a large amount of electrons trapped in that magnetic field. Now, this was very important when we sent the space first spacecraft out there. Not only did the pioneers go through um, the asteroid belt for the first time, which was a big un unknown, uh, but also to go into this high radiation environment. And indeed, the pioneers um, detected strong radiation, noted that they were being, the radiation was absorbed by the moons, and this produced a very large magnetosphere. The pioneers also took some pictures, very old pictures, but it's interesting, look at that last one, on the, that one on the right, and remember this when I come to Juno. This was a high latitude view. This has been reconstructed using all of the data from Pioneer. Now, of course, Voyager, we're celebrating just this month, the 40th anniversary of the Voyager flyby of Jupiter. Fantastic observations of the dynamics of the atmosphere, very strong winds, the belts and zones, and the great red spot, of course. But of course, what everyone remembers about Voyager 1 was EO, and had this remarkable discovery of a very volcanic, the most geologically active object in our solar system with vast volcanoes. You can see um, the plume here sticking up to 300 kilometers above the surface, and again, very active on the surf, uh, active geology. Now, for some time from the ground, people were looking at charged particles. In this case, it's emission from S plus sulfur, ionized sulfur coming from the EO plasma torus. This has been known for since the 70s. Uh, but as Voyager approached, the Voyager UVS took measurements of high ionization states, high density uh, in this plasma torus. And then the Voyager plasma science instrument made this in situ measurements of these uh, multiple uh, ions here. And this became my PhD thesis. We also, with Voyager, took pictures of uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These are beautifully reconstructed um, images, taking all of the Voyager data, putting it together to make these moons. And uh, I think Bob will tell you a lot more about these objects. Now, what's interesting is that sometime later, when um, 16 years later, when uh, Galileo, the orbiter, was put into orbit around Jupiter. Uh, the probe was sent into the atmosphere of Jupiter. And the idea here was to measure the composition and the behavior of the, uh, uh, the atmosphere of Jupiter. And what we found, though, which was the most important result, 
is that uh, while most of the elements seem to be enhanced by a factor of two to three over solar composition, uh, the amount of oxygen, the amount of water was very low, and that implies a very low oxygen. And as, a, as the first speaker mentioned, this is the third most abundant element, and so we're very surprised that we see so little of it. And this is totally contrary to our ideas of uh, our solar system formation. So the big question at the end of the Galileo probe era was whether or not this was a local lack of water or whether it was global. Now, of course, uh, Galileo made these lovely maps of Callisto and Io, and, uh, but the most important thing, perhaps, in terms of moons, one of the most important things is that Ganymede was found to have a magnetic field. Um, the magnetometer measured this magnetosphere within a magnetosphere. Uh, this, uh, the interior of, the, of Ganymede generating this, this strong dynamo. And the consequence of this is that uh, the interaction of charged particles with the atmosphere produces this oxygen atmosphere, produces aurora, uh, and the bombardment of material, uh, the radiolysis of the polar regions changes um, the uh, structure and composition of the polar region ice. Now, of course, the other major detection was uh, that Europa has a large liquid ocean. This was discovered by measuring um, electrical currents, the perturbations in magnetic field measured uh, when Galileo flew by, indicated that there was a large uh, conducting ocean underneath. And uh, the big question then became whether or not these brown, the brown gunk here is uh, from the inside coming through the cracks or whether it's from the outside. And indeed, Bob will talk more, I'm sure, about this soon. So Jupiter has been used because of its large mass as a source of gravity assist. In this case, Cassini got a gravity assist on its way to Saturn. It made these beautiful uh, images of the uh, movie of the belts and zones in the atmosphere, the best we'd, we'd uh, received to date. And then uh, the other thing is that the UV instrument was able to make these very high-resolution spectral measurements of the EO plasma torus putting together this movie, showing you how this donut of charged material wobbles with the tilted magnetic field of Jupiter. So a ton a second of sulfur dioxide is spewed out of this moon, becomes ionized and trapped in the magnetic field, spreads out, becomes highly uh, energized, and then begins to uh, come back and impact on the planet. So what we see here when New Horizons got a gravity assist on its way to Pluto, we have this lovely movie showing Tvashtar erupting, one of those big plumes erupting out sulfur dioxide and dust. Uh, but also the trajectory of New Horizons went down the tail of the magnetosphere to for 2,500 Jovian radii and along the way measured blobs of material. This is the result of that one ton a second of material coming out of those plumes, becoming ionized, energized, and eventually spat out in blobs down the tail. Uh, this tail, of course, we knew from Voyager 2, extends all the way to the orbit of Saturn. So this is one of the, the largest object, if you can call it an object, magnetospheric region uh, in our solar system. Now, Juno has been in orbit around Jupiter for um, uh, since July of 2016. Uh, and the gravity measurements, it gets very close to the planet, flying over the poles. And this proximity has allowed us to measure the gravity in the magnetic field very accurately. And the gravity field has told us that instead of having a solid inner core of about uh, 15 Earth masses, we have a more extended region where the heavier elements are mixed in with the metallic hydrogen out to about 40% of the radius. We're also looking at the magnetic field and seeing that the north and south poles are very different. The north pole is much stronger than the south, and there is uh, an um, anomaly at the equatorial region. So we're seeing this structure as we look closer. We're also seeing um, the ammonia concentration 
Uh, we're observing with the microwave, looking through the clouds to see the interior. And we're measuring that there's a lot of structure in the convection of a deep convection of ammonia. Uh, we're also looking for water. We're trying to work out the total amount of water. Stay tuned on that, I bet, but that by the end of the year, uh, we'll be announcing whether or not um, we've got a globe, what the global number is for the amount of water in the system. We're also looking at the magnetosphere flying over the pole, looking at the aurora, and testing our ideas of what part processes accelerate the particles to make them hit the uh, atmosphere. And all I can say, it's not what the, the people who study the Earth were predicting. It's much more complicated, which is fun and exciting, of course. One of the most interesting things is we've flown through the flux tube that connects EO to the planet. Very char lots of charged particles accelerated, bombarding the planet and producing very interesting auroral processes. And then also the infrared camera has been looking at the uh, volcanic regions on EO. Perhaps the most important thing with Juno is the observations made by the camera, the Juno cam instrument looking at the polar region, the infrared looking at the polar region, eight vortices around the pole in the north, five in the south. This has been a fairly persistent system over the past 20 months, uh, and we're beginning to get really interesting views of this atmosphere. Of course, Clipper and uh, Juice will be back looking at the icy moons, uh, but I want to leave you with this summary and have have you look at this beautiful movie made by citizen scientists. One of the great successes of this mission is the role of citizen science, looking at these images and putting them together. Look out for Danny the dolphin as he flies by. Uh, and I will summarize by just saying, we now have 79 moons around Jupiter. 79, did you hear that? <laughs> Big number. Uh, we need to model this atmosphere. Oops. I lost Danny the dolphin, never mind. There we go. Um, we are going to go back and look at Europa. Let's have a mission to EO, please. Uh, to understand this magnetosphere, we will need to have multiple spacecraft. Who knows what we'll see in the next 50 years? Thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. Why didn't we see any water in the Galileo probe? Why didn't we see the water in the Galileo probe? That's the big question that Juno is addressing. Um, the answer, I believe, is probably that it went into a very dry area. It's like landing in the Sahara. It was just bad luck that we happened to go there. It was between a region and belts and zone. Um, but it's very important to know whether or not that amount of oxygen is comparable to the other abundant uh, heavy elements and whether it's at the two to three point um, and uh, above solar. And we're working on that and we'll get results, I, I think. Yeah, thank you. I didn't see anybody standing up there. Okay. All right, the next talk is by Bob Papalardo from the moon to the icy Galilean satellites. Uh, thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Back when I taught a planetary surfaces class uh, years ago, the students would bemoan the fact that we spent half the term learning about geological processes as exemplified by the moon. My reply to them was, and still is, the basis for everything we know in planetary science we learned from the moon. This is true even for the disti distant icy Galilean satellites of Jupiter. Uh, you know these, this cast of characters here, the Galileo spacecraft, uh, which as Fran introduced, um, orbited from 95 to 03 with every uh, orbit passed uh, made a close flyby of one of the Galilean uh, satellites. Uh, Fran introduced Io a bit. I'll concentrate on 
Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto with the moon there for scale. Ganymede and Callisto, about half ice, half rock. And Europa, really mainly a rocky object with a skin of H2O, about 100 kilometers thick. There we go. Callisto, uh, we thought from Voyager data, would be very heavily cratered and moon-like. What we saw up close uh, was a landscape that was heavily cratered, cratered uh, uh, by large craters, but small craters were relatively depleted. We saw uh, things like pits, which suggested sublimation erosion, and there's evidence of mass movement, uh, dark materials moving down slope within craters, with also evidence for CO2 in the surface and in the atmosphere uh, from the near-infrared uh, data, what seems to be going on at Callisto is that carbon dioxide is so slowly sublimating over time, leaving dark lag and uh, bright knobs are where uh, uh, ices have, have clung to as cold traps. Uh, overall, uh, there is a lack of small craters on Callisto, which may be from mass wasting, or even a lack of small impactors. But there's also a lot of spatial variability of the small crater populations. And that may be due to, as, as uh, Kai Williams and I looked at, for very small craters less than a kilometer on Callisto. So we, we found a lot of variability there here in our, our plot. Here's the equilibrium line. And, and we're generally well below uh, equilibrium. And so that could be due to local secondaries, or it could be due to local erasure by large impacts before small craters are able to recover uh, to equilibrium. Recall that impact resetting can occur where large impacts affect a greater planetary surface area than smaller craters. So that may be happening here on Callisto. For Ganymede, uh, the um, surface of dark terrain is quite segregated into dark and bright patches. Again, there may be a, a thermal segregation going on. Our LPI director is an artist in, back in the day um, and studied uh, groove terrain, uh, sorry, dark terrain on Ganymede. And this illustrates the idea that what we're seeing is a surface lag in the dark terrain of Ganymede uh, above brighter material below. Impacts can penetrate through that and excavate some of this brighter material. So generally, imp uh, tectonics and impacts shaping the dark terrain of Ganymede. The bright groove terrain of Ganymede consisting of these subparallel ridges and grooves. Uh, we knew of kind of an eight kilometer scale from Voyager images and the Galileo images showed that, that uh, uh, the groove terrain of Ganymede is finely striated and highly tectonized. Uh, Jeff Collins and I looked at some strained craters where we could get a feel for how much strain is involved if this crater was originally circular. So here, for example, 14% strain. And we're starting to even lose the identity of, of uh, this crater. So above a couple of tens of percent strain, and craters could even disappear on Ganymede. Uh, the prominent bounding troughs, which were known from Voyager, we saw, and maybe prominent faults. Uh, there's probably extensional boudinage, which forms the multiple, the longer wavelength of Ganymede's groove terrain than the finer scale ridges and cross superimposed by uh, brittle faulting of that upper uh, brittle layer. Uh, there's still a debate as to the role of cryovolcanism in smoothing and brightening groove terrain on Ganymede. Ganymede has a variety of impact craters. Again, harking back to the kinds of classifications of lunar craters, we see central peak uh, uh, craters, dark and bright floored. But then we start to get into some, some morphologies that are more or less unique to the icy satellites. We see pedestal craters, where we do on Mars as well. And then we transition 
into central pit and central dome craters. And then larger impacts uh, are rather flat, relaxed uh, topography, subtle topography. And as we'll see in a second, the, the ejecta blanket appears bright. It's, uh, these impacts have dug up brighter material from below to create a bright patch known as a palimpsest on Ganymede or on Callisto. In fact, impact materials on um, the icy satellites, examples here, Ganymede and Callisto, uh, were from Voyager data thought potentially to be volcanic. And we see that impact materials can masquerade as volcanic materials. So here's Buto facula that we were looking at a second ago, and the Voyager image showed it to be a bright patch. We weren't sure if it was icy volcanism, but it's clearly, as we look at it, the, the um, uh, continuous ejected blanket instead. There are planes seen in Voyager that show no, no obvious signs of icy volcanism, but instead were probably uh, patches of material, these palimpsest-like impacts uh, that were excavated below dark materials. And smooth material on Callisto associated with some of its basin rings are mass-wasted smooth materials. And if we look back to the lunar lessons of the Cayley Plains that Sean Solomon alluded to earlier in his Mercury talk, where we had to go there to understand that these are impact melt brushes and not uh, highlands volcanism. So, it, so lessons from the moon apply to the icy satellites. Uh, in the time remaining, I'll speak to Europa, which shows the ridged plains crisscrossing ridges and grooves. We still don't fully understand how these ridges form, despite their being ubiquitous on Europa's surface. Um, potentially tidal stresses, working uh, fractures. Uh, we also see the darker modeled terrains uh, and chaotic terrain, which appear to result from a, a reworking, a disintegration, and a replacement of the older ridged plains. Um, not to scale here, but uh, the fact that Europa likely has an ocean, as implied by magnetic induction, uh, magnetic data, which suggests induction. Um, we have tidal flexing that could be as much as 30 meters every time Europa orbits Jupiter each 85 hours, three and a half Earth days. And that flexing drives stresses on the order of tens of kilopascals, which can fracture the surface. But also an ice shell above an ocean can reorient um, there could be non-synchronous rotation of the ice shell relative to the rocky interior. There can be true polar wander. And those motions and deformation that results of the ice shell can trigger stresses up to megapascals. We see bands on Europa uh, where uh, pre-existing ridges have opened up to expose material from beneath. Sam Howell has recently done some beautiful modeling of how material can make it all the way from the ice-ocean interface up to the surface in the centers of these bands. The ice shell is likely convecting, at least in places, uh, as implied by the existence of these pits, spots, and domes several kilometers across where the surface has been upwarped um, or new material has extruded onto the surface. Uh, this is a somewhat old model by Amy Barr uh, showing how convective upwellings from the ice ocean interface can reach shallow depths, but then other processes, compositional or thermal buoyancy, are needed to breach that cold, stagnant lid. We see the famed and aptly named chaos terrain uh, on Europa, Konamara, chaos, and these, these city-scale blocks of ice, and the matrix in between. Here's Thera. Um, and Brittany Schmidt has advocated an intra-ice model for the formation of chaos, where local melting could create a lake uh, and cause collapse of the surface above due to volume change from melting. Uh, and then as this freezes, it may buoy a chaos region back up. So chaos are places we want to look for water below the surface. Also harping back to uh, the lunar literature, our models of 
uh, how we might get spots, diffuse spots, seen along some features at Europa, like Radamanthes linea here. And um, it's possible, as Fajans et al. and Linné Quick have each modeled, that these relate to, um, uh, to volatile driven extrusion of materials of plumes that may tap liquids uh, in the shallow subsurface. Unlike Enceladus, where fractures can penetrate deeply on Europa, it's much harder to penetrate deeply because of the higher gravity, and so, um, uh, so fractures may be tapping subsurface reservoir, intra-ice reservoirs. Instead, we didn't see obvious evidence of plumes from uh, Galileo images. There were very few that could be used for plume searches, like this photobomb of a rings image uh, taken on the, the 10th orbit of Galileo. But of course, Hubble Space Telescope suggests evidence of um, hydrogen and oxygen glow above the surface of Europa. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip that and go right to the comparative uh, interiors of the satellites, Callisto, from the gravity data suggesting it is incompletely differentiated, um, yet has an ocean based on the magnetometry data at Callisto. Ganymede passed tumultuous activity promoting full differentiation and a hot iron core to generate its magnetic field and a perched water ocean at similar 100 kilometer depth. But Europa, with that ocean in contact with rock below uh, the most Earth-like ocean um, of the three with pressures and temperatures and potentially composition that is Earth-like. And of course, I'll close with the fact that we have a mission that we are getting ready to send there to Europa to explore it that much better. Examples of the remote sensing coverage here, and we also have a neutral gas spectrometer, a dust analyzer, plasma investigation, and as you probably heard in the news, a new facility magnetometer uh, to add to the ice penetrating radar, the camera suite, the uh, thermal imager, the ultraviolet spectrograph, and the infrared spectrometer. Thank you very much. OK, we have time for a question. Bob, based on your knowledge of Europa, what does your instinct tell you the best place for the lander to touch down and give us a window into that ocean and what organics and what that ocean might look like. Where should the lander touch down? What kind of feature do you think? I, I know that the lander study team thought about this a lot. This has come up also in discussions among the Europa Clipper science team. Uh, what we understand today, if we, had, if, if we had only information from today, I think people would say scientifically theramacula is intriguing as a place where there could potentially be liquid water under the surface today, given it still has low topography, suggesting collapse of the surface above a, a large subsurface lake. We'll see what the data tell us. OK, thank you. OK. Those coming in, make sure you don't block the door. Come on in. Uh, although we're full, uh, there are some seats scattered hither and yon. Okay, our next talk is Titan since Apollo. Uh, Ralph Lawrence. Uh, as you've you've heard, there are many uh, unique moons in the solar system, uh, but the case could be made that some are more unique than others, and. <laughs> 50, 50 years ago, um, that was all, almost all that was known about Titan. It was known that it had an atmosphere um, that contained methane, and there was um, very little more known about it. Um, and actually, if you want to read about what was known, it's almost all encapsulated in a single small proceedings volume, um, which you can download. Uh, it's a NASA, NASA document. And as well as including papers on basically everything that was known, um, it's a wonderful document because it records also the discussion that followed the papers. So you can read you know, Carl Sagan tearing into John Lewis and all the, the great, great names of, of, of uh, planetary science um, debating you know, what, what this all meant. Remember also that this period, you know, the early 70s, um, was, was when planetary science was, was really just blossoming. Um, the first uh, landing on the surface of Venus 
was, was just the year before, 1972. Uh, Mariner 9 had be, just been mapping Mars and revealing its diversity at, at this point. So there was a, a lot going on, a lot of very fertile um, uh, comparative planetological discussions going on. And the key question was, you know, what, what was Titan's surface like? How warm uh, could it be? Could it be habitable? Um, there was a lot of enthusiasm, uh, especially with, with Carl Sagan, for the prospect that a, a thick greenhouse atmosphere might bring the surface temperature to a habitable degree, you know, to the, the, the melting point of water. Uh, John Lewis, at this point, was uh, advocating uh, the abundance of, of water and ice in the, in the outer solar system and the prospect that there might be uh, uh, water oceans in the interiors. We knew there was methane. We knew there was uh, some warm emission from Titan. It wasn't known whether this was stratospheric uh, from uh, haze or gases in the, in the upper atmosphere or even just a thin atmosphere, or whether it was uh, emission like from Venus uh, from a, a deep, warm greenhouse interior. And actually, with, as with many sort of dichotomous debates in, in the exploration of the solar system, it was a fal false choice. Both actually turned out to be true, this uh, sort of summary sketch. Um, captures both, and it was, it was, this was by uh, Don Hunton. And you can read about uh, some of these debates in a, in a recent book that's uh, available downstairs. Um, <laughs> shameless plug. Um, the, uh, th this, of course, set up the, the scientific question, you know, how do we demonstrate what is the surface pressure, what is the surface temperature on Titan? And uh, the gold standard for doing that without actually landing is, is radio occultation. And so the Voyager mission, the Voyager 1 encounter, was designed to bend a radio signal through Titan's atmosphere to nail that. Uh, and it did. It was uh, you know, this result that holds up within a percent or so of what we know today. Um, and in fact, had Voyager 1 failed, Voyager 2 would have been retargeted to do that um, experiment and would not have been able to visit Uranus and Neptune. Um, we saw with uh, Voyager's infrared spectrometer about tw 20 different uh, organic compounds. It's a very rich organic chemistry, not just uh, hydrocarbons, as you, as you find on Jupiter, but nitriles. It's a very important point that um, you know, every amino acid, every, every base pair that encodes information in our DNA contains nitrogen. And it may be that the uh, Jovian system, because of its formation conditions, is, is relatively deprived of that element as, as well as uh, carbon compared to, uh, compared to the Saturnian system. Of course, the surface was hidden. So uh, for the next decade, uh, Titan remained very much a, a DPS kind of world rather than an LPSC kind of world. Um, <laughs> but as, um, as, as, as uh, telescope uh, telescope techniques progressed, um, moving into the early 90s, um, Titan actually became the sort of prototypical exoplanet. Um, models by Chris McKay, Mark Lemon, and others uh, were started to show in the near infrared how one could decode the depth of these methane bands into the atmospheric structure. You know, how much haze was there as a function of height? Uh, and in fact, in the windows between these bands where some light actually does percolate through Titan's atmosphere to the surface. Uh, it was found that Titan was not uniform. And this is very important because the impression you get looking at the Voyager image is that it's longitudinally uniform. It's kind of a one-dimensional place. And the near IR light curve showed that there were dark and bright patches. And that means that the stuff drizzling down from the atmosphere isn't drizzling down uniformly everywhere, or there's some processes that are sh shuffling it around, weather or, or other activity. And indeed, the... Uh, the bright and dark nature was revealed um, uh, in the early 90s with the first Hubble images, about, about uh, 18 pixels across. Of course, this was the um, backdrop against which the uh, Cassini mission was formulated and developed. Um, and there we go. Um, and that took, uh, took seven years, of course, to get out to, uh, to, to Saturn and, and Titan. The, the Huygens descent was uh, a, you know, a profound uh, moment. There was, uh, after that, no more debate about whether Titan has um, has rain or rivers because we saw these uh, rounded cobbles, we saw the, um, the dendritic uh, fluvial networks. Uh, Eric Karkoschka uh, on the DISO team at the University of Arizona made this very nice montage pointing out that the, this view from the Huygens probe after landing, which we had no right to expect, by the way, there was no guarantee that the probe would survive. You know, this is taken from about knee high. Uh, and uh, so there's an unusual perspective, but Eric laid it out against this, uh, this Apollo footprint, which I think is a, a wonderful product. 
Um, Cassini was uh, starting to explore uh, Titan piece by piece, fly by by fly by, month by month. Um, and, and it was literally like getting a, a jigsaw puzzle, you know, once every few, uh, a, a piece of a jigsaw puzzle, once every few weeks. And over the, the, the years, um, you know, we really learned how diverse a place Titan is. This is a, a Vim's mosaic by, uh, by Jason Barnes. You know, there are craters. There are uh, what turned out to be massive dune fields. This is about 200 kilometers across. In fact, the observation of, of dunes on Titan really stimulated the, um, the, uh, the sort of dune whispering relationship of uh, dune morphology to, to winds uh, on Earth as, as well as on Titan. Um, we see some spectral diversity. These uh, dark, uh, bright uh, red areas are believed to be uh, evaporites left behind when, when lakes dried up. Um, there's, there was debate about whether there is or has been uh, cryovolcanism on Titan. There's, there's really a lot going on. As um, we moved into the latter part of the decade and, and uh, into the 2010s, um, the attention focused on Titan's poles and the, the lakes and seas. This is Ligia Mare, uh, about 400 kilometers across. The uh, uh, cloud patterns in the troposphere evolved. The, uh, the uh, haze and other structures in the stratosphere evolved. There's you know, structures like the Earth's ozone hole, but the, the, you know, the chemistry is different, but the, the dynamics are, are similar. Um, and uh, in fact, around about this time, there, were, there was a proposal for a capsule even to, to, to float around in the seas. So that looking um, to the future, um, we, we actually go back to the future in a sense, in that with the successful completion of Cassini, with its 126 Titan flybys, um, we are going to have to rely on uh, ground-based assets again. Um, now, that's interesting because uh, Titan shows seasonal and, and uh, shorter timescale changes. And in fact, one Titan year is not like the, the last Titan year. There's interannual variability. That's actually um, been observed uh, by patient measurements with a small telescope at Lowell Observatory by, by Wes Lockwood since 1973, I think. Um, you know, there's some memory in the climate system, whether it's the seas or it's the dust or or whether it's uh, the solar cycle, we, we don't know. Um, one of the most powerful tools that's emerged in recent years is the ALMA radio telescope, which operating as an interferometer can make spatially resolved measurements of the distribution of some of these gases as they move around uh, seasonally in the upper atmosphere. Uh, we are monitoring clouds in the near infrared. Uh, those um, seasonal patterns are starting to be quite well reproduced by, by models. There's a lot more model refinement to go. There's a lot of laboratory work to really fully interpret what we've learned from Cassini. Of course, the, we look to the future. In fact, we've been looking to the future for, for uh, almost a couple of decades now. One can reasonably imagine landers, uh, Titan's dunes, among other places. People have advocated hot air balloons, orbiters. There's a lot of uh, mapping still to do. Uh, Cassini's coverage is by no means complete and, and certainly by no means as high resolution as one can attain. Uh, there are other uh, vehicles that have been proposed. Um, and as you may know, um, there is presently under consideration uh, by NASA in the New Frontiers competition a, a concept called Dragonfly. There were some posters um, uh, yesterday. Uh, and in some ways, this captures uh, the, the features of a lander and a balloon, right? You get the aerial imaging um, and the, the sort of you know, vistas uh, from the sky and mobility um, and the ability to access surface material and de really determine what the, 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 the chemistry is, what kind of prebiotic synthesis has occurred, um, and do seismology and weather and all the rest of it. In fact, um, as it turns out, I happen to be uh, born uh, about uh, five weeks after Apollo 11, and so that means this summer is my 50th birthday. So if NASA should be motivated to give me a nice present, and, <laughs> and, and, and I think all of you a nice present, then I, I can't imagine anything more exciting than a, a radioisotope-powered octocopter with drills and a neutron gun. So, thank you. <laughs> We have uh, time for several questions. I, I should add that this, this, although this is the most immediate prospect for another mission, it by no means um, undermines the opportunity that other platforms can offer. Uh, you know, there's, Titan is a rich place with a lot going on at different scales, and so orbital views um, and exploration of the seas are still, still wide open. Uh, Tim Livengood, University of Maryland. Yes, 
What about pontoons? Ah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, working on the Titan Mario Explorer concept um, you know, back in, in 2010, 2012. And you know, one has to confront some quite challenging environmental interactions with such a mission. You know, how big are the waves? Uh, how much does the capsule move in response to those waves? Um, and one can develop a very reasonable and um, uh, robust uh, design solutions to, to that sort of question. Whether review panels evaluate those in, in, in the same spirit is you know, sometimes open to question. Uh, so introducing to a uh, rotorcraft the additional possibilities of, of ground interactions that are challenging to model um, is, is maybe a, a step too far. I think a, you know, a, 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 an octocopter um, that can explore dozens of locations on the surface is, is enough to bite off in one step. But by all means, in the future, um, the, the, the seas need, need to be explored separately. We still have plenty of time. Sean. Sean Solomon, Columbia. Uh, kind of a wild question, but I want to couple your talk with Bill Botke's talk. Uh, Titan may be too active a body, but is it possible that the, the moons of Saturn have any record of the migration of Saturn to its present position? Uh, that's an interesting question. So. Um, uh, Quite possibly, yes, but whether such a record can be teased out from the other things that have been going on, um, I, I suspect it's entirely plausible that there has been, in microcosm, uh, a, a, a version of the Nice model in the Saturnian system. Uh, there was a, a, a really nice talk uh, earlier this week in the, the, the um, IC Moon session by Eric Asphalt, who was um, talking about the, the possible impact origin of Titan. Um, there is architectural, um, architecturally puzzling aspects of the Saturnian system, why there should be this one overridingly large moon and lots of little moons instead of the, the paradigm that prevails both at Uranus and uh, Jupiter with four sort of you know, medium-sized moons. So something quite likely has gone on, um, but it's, uh, I think it's going to be impossible to uniquely disentangle what the solar system was doing from what the Saturnian system was doing. Okay, I'll, I'll take one question then, Ralph. Um, despite the, um, the rather large number of encounters that Cassini had, the radar coverage is still limited. Can you remind us how much have we actually, I, I know you can see it in the infrared somewhat, um, the, the, you talked about gold standards. I think the gold standard probably for surface imaging at Titan will be the radar. How, how much of it remains to be seen? Uh, so, you know, that, that's one of those how long is a piece of string questions. If, if one adopts a resolution threshold of, say, one kilometer as your, your standard, then um, we've covered about 40, 50 percent of Titan surface with radar. Um, but, you know, radar is, is essentially a monochromatic kind of measurement. Uh, there are several near-infrared spectral windows, and the near-infrared coverage at Titan that Cassini was able to achieve uh, is, is at that resolution only a percent or so. So there's an awful lot of uh, low-hanging fruit, if you like, uh, to be plucked at Titan with, um, with a near-infrared mapper, for example. Okay. Thank you very much. The next talk is by Waite, Klein, Postberg, and Lenin. Enceladus, as revealed by the Cassini-Huygens mission, Hunter Waite is the speaker. Thank you. Um, I grew up in Huntsville, Alabama in the 1950s and 1960s, and my dad worked for NASA throughout the uh, Apollo era, so it's a really great pleasure to be here to talk to you today. I do want to, I, I guess I get, have the distinction of talking about the smallest object of the day, which is Enceladus. I'll go on to the first slide. It has a diameter of about 500 kilometers, a density of 1.6 grams per cc. You can see uh, from this figure that it's sitting about three radi Saturn radii. Uh, it was embedded in the E-ring 
which was a mystery when we went there. It quickly was resolved. Uh, the magnetometer saw an interesting deflection in the magnetic field that suggested something was going on, and we targeted the moon early and found out it was gushing out material, both in the form of water, and I'll go through that, as well as ice particles that were actually the, at the origin of the E-ring. So the E-ring is made by Enceladus itself. I'm going to talk about the present understanding, uh, in particular, a uh, combination of uh, data from both gravity and imaging have given a coherent picture of the internal structure. The uh, core density, so this is a rock portion, is about 2.3 to 2.5 grams per cc. With the core radius, it's about uh, on the order of 200 kilometers. The water plus ice mantle is about 50 kilometers thick. The ice shell thickness uh, varies, is about 20 to 25 on, in general, but it probably thins to about five, kilometer, five to 10 kilometers at the South Pole, where we, where, where, where we see the geysers coming out. So ha having established that we have an internal ocean and knowing that the material that's coming out of the interior is coming from that ocean was an important accomplishment that Cassini made. Some of the evidence that suggested that we were looking at an internal ocean Salts and bicarbonates were seen by the cosmic dust analyzer experiment in the grains similar to the Earth's ocean. I'll come back to this point. We saw organic chemical compounds measured both in the gases and the grains. We saw silicon dioxide nanograins that are suggestive in internal hydrothermal systems. And uh, towards the end of the mission, we measured H2 in the plume, which was a yet another indication of an in in internal hydrothermal system. And this is a figure that kind of shows schematically how that might happen, a cutaway. All right, so let me go into the details of some of the things we know about the interior ocean, the geochemistry of the interior ocean. Over here we have information from the ice grains, some of the original material that shows various salts that are contained in the grains. In this particular case, ocean spray comes up and is flash frozen into ice grains that are about one micron in size, and from that material, then you get a kind of a direct analysis of the salty material in the ocean. This salinity that's produced from these, are indicated by this, is about four times less than the salinity of the Earth's ocean. In the case of uh, the ion mass spectrometer, we measured gaseous materials. These are the major gases that we saw, H2O, CO2, CH4, and ammonia and hydrogen. Um, there, I'll go come to some more complicated scenarios, but these are the ones where we have fairly definite ideas of how much material we saw in the plume. The question is, how do you relate it to what would be in the ocean? And part of the problem is that the water vapor freezes out in the tiger stripes as it comes up. So we get, that's it. the water is just an indication of what, what comes at the temperature equilibrium with the last like half uh, kilometer of the vent. So to tell you how we do this, this is a procedure that Chris Klein put together. We start with the pH and the uh, total dissolved carbonate as in, uh, starting conditions. Use this in um, models to determine the speciation, particularly the CO2 molality. From that, we just take the ratios of the materials of the other gases that we see relative to CO2, and from that, we determine what the molality of the various other species are in the uh, plume, at least the ones that are non-sticky species that will not be frozen out on the way up or affected by the ice. Now, one of the interesting things that came out of this was to be able to use this measurement of what, what the uh, chemistry of the ocean was to try to determine if there were, it was chemical energy that could be used for men, metabolic processes in the interior. So we took the methanogenesis reaction, H2CO2 going to methane plus H2O, and we evaluated the chemical affinity for that reaction based on the molalities of these species we determined. And for the pH range that we, were, we, we knew was present, 
we see that there's a positive affinity, so there's H2 chemical energy in the interior ocean that could be used for metabolic processes. Now, the other thing that's of interest, of course, certainly if, with regard to habitability, is the organic content. This is a uh, spectrum from the ion mass spectrometer that goes up. I don't know what happened to the labels, but <laughs> it's in some font that is unknown. <laughs> Anyway, this is 0 to 100 AMU across this axis. <laughs> the various colors, uh, let's see, we're, we got water. <laughs> water, is, water is blue. Uh, I have to work my way through this. CH4 and uh, I believe NH3 are the green. The red is from CO2. Uh, yellow is from... Hmm. various hydrocarbons. These are probably C2 hydrocarbons. And then there are higher order hydrocarbons. C3 hydrocarbons are the orange. And C4 and C, well, C6 hydrocarbons are the purple. And the species are actually listed here. And for, fortunately, they're not in the foreign font because I cannot make, I would not be able to reproduce this. But these major volatiles that I spoke about are here. But in addition to that, we at least have not unambiguously, but determine the possibility there's a whole host of organic compounds that exist here, including a whole list of um, hydrocarbon species. With the resolution of our mass spectrometer, we can't determine exactly what they are, but we know that there's a, quite a bit of organic material. And that's in the gas itself. So this portion of the spectrum is what determined the soluble organic content that came out of the ocean. This portion of the spectrum, this was obtained on a, fl a flyby E5 through uh, Enceladus, and that was at s about 18 kilometers per second. So this represents material that's fragmented, material that was in embedded in an ice grain. And it does have the signature of benzene. I'll come back to this in a minute. This is what Frank Prostberg has referred to as, as a high molecular organic compound fragments. First, let me say a little bit about what the, the, uh, the um, soluble organics that are seen in the gas phase. One of the difficulties in actually quantifying this material is they interact with the grains as they come out. This is a plot that kind of that shows you the extent of, of how that might happen. So we took a, just an equal mixture of organics, potential organics compounds that we had determined and then we run it through the model and we see what the actual grain coverage is. And because of the uh, energy of the absorption, acetic acid dominates what's frozen out in the grain. Then propanol, so the alcohols, are also predominantly frozen to the grain. So it does fractionate this material significantly on its way out, attaching to the grains. Um, Fortune, okay, so that's, that, that's just um, words about that. The mo more important part here from the organic point of view is this is material that was actually embedded within the ice grain that came up out of the ocean. And so this, is, the, this has not been affected by any kind of fractionation processes. And this is part of what Frank Ber Postberg has uh, written about recently in Nature. This shows a... Uh, impact spectrum that goes over a very large mass range. You can see compounds that go up to 2,000 U in this material. There, there's a whole host of very structured organics that are part of the fragmentation process. There's also smaller fragments identified as well. So there's a very rich organic material that came up out of the ocean that is insoluble. And so let me try to finish up quickly by telling you what I think we would need to do when we go back to Enceladus. What's the important thing to measure? First point is back to these high molecular organic compounds. We really want to know what's in those. We, we need to know what's, and we need to know what's in the soluble organics as well. So we need high mass resolution mass spectrometry to be able to determine exactly what this material is, what does it mean? What does it have? Where was it formed? It, it really shouldn't even be there. 
And finally, and the other thing, or, well, a couple of embedded things. The other thing that I th am particularly interested in is trying to pursue this idea of what other possible metabolisms might be supported by the uh, internal ocean in terms of chemical affinities. A particular importance to me are sulfur-bearing species, which we have seen they have very little or no evidence for at the present time. So those are the two things that stand out to me as the most important things to go back and see. Now, that leaves out this whole area of the search for life, which is clearly a whole different game, and it's not anything I'm going to get into today. But just based on the observational evidence, these are the things you would want to go back and try to straighten out. So I'll kind of end with this note. We have a global water, ocean. Chon has been quantified, probably uh, sulfur in the form of H2S. Phosphate, no. Importantly, H2 is a chemical energy source, and there are a whole lot of large and small organic compounds that are coming out of the plume. I'll stop there. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions. Hi, Carol Stoker at NASA Ames. Is there any way to infer from what you have actually measured in the plume what the concentration of organics might be in the ocean? Uh, very good question. Um, I think that is possible because we probably, with the C2 compounds, we have a pretty good idea of what that percentage would be. It's a like uh, point, some, somewhere below 0.1% in terms of to total organic content. But it does, that's mostly, I'm talking about the soluble organics. Uh, it's harder to come up with a number for the insoluble component. I think Frank uh, and I decided that it was somewhere on the order of 0.001% of the total outflowing material, which is about 200 kilograms per second. James Haber, Purdue University. Um, do you think that these observations could be clarified with just a flyby and a uh, sampling of the plume material, or do you think that a more in-depth mission architecture would be needed? That's a very good question. Um, it's, I think we've done amazing, one of the things about Enceladus is it's giving the sample right in your face, and it makes it very amenable to flybys. And so I would, I'm a fan of that. Now, I'm also a fan of orbiting things because long ago I worked on a, um, a study about Titan orbiters with Ralph Lorenz, who just spoke, and he pointed out to me in about the second month of the study, he said, do you realize that it will take one week for us to get more data than Cassini got in the whole mission? And, and so an orbiter is a, clearly a good way to get a lot of samples, and I think that's important. Landing, um, it has its risk. These places that you would want to access uh, are not very flat <laughs> and not easy to get to. Uh, ultimately, if you're going to try to look for life, you're going to have to get into the ocean, so John's submarines are going to have to go. <laughs> John Culberson, what about dropping a probe through one of those crevasses? Are the crevasses permanently open? How widely open are they? And certainly if they exist on Europa, since we have a lander going to Europa anyway, why not uh, attach some uh, drop probes on the end of those sky crane, uh, on the sky crane going to Europa and try to get down into those crevasses, into the ocean? Yeah. Well, the, the uh, crevasses range from about, well, our understanding is that they're somewhere between 10 centimeters in diameter to about two meters. So they're pretty small, and they're probably fairly torturous pass to the interior ocean. I'm not in, opposed at all into trying to drop something into them and see what we can find out, but uh, it, it may not make it to the ocean. Okay, thank you. Our next talk is uh, the exploration of Uranus and Neptune looking into the past and towards the future of ice giant planets. Soderlund, Hofstadter, Simon, et al., uh, Krista Soderlund.
Thank you. And thank you to the organizers for the invitation to present on the ice giants today. I'm going to be presenting a wide view of ice giant systems, so I'd like to start off by acknowledging all of my co-authors who are really able to help me put together this broad view of this uh, system. So in celebration of this special session on 50 years of planetary science, I wanted to begin with a historical perspective. And in this one, it is, is what we've known before Apollo. And in summary, it's not that much for the ice giants. So Uranus was discovered in 1781, and this is more than 100 years after the discovery of the Galilean satellites and also of the Saturnian satellite Titan. And it was followed shortly thereafter with the discoveries of Enceladus and Ceres. And through these observations of Uranus, they were able to find that there were small irregularities in the orbit, and that could only be explained by the presence of a larger body further out in the solar system. So this led to the observation of Neptune, where it was mathematically predicted and then found through observations that way. And that was in 1846, so that was about 65 years after the discovery of Uranus. And then the next major milestone was in the mid-1980s when we had the Voyager 2 flybys of Uranus in 1986 and of Neptune in 1989. And this is where we got our first detailed glimpse into ice giant systems, and this is where I'll actually spend most of my time in the talk discussing what we've learned and also what questions remain from this information that we learned. And then 20 years after that, there was the launch of the Kepler mission, and this is where we got a profound view of exoplanets. And in the schematic that I'm showing here, as I'm basically plotting the number of exoplanets that have been detected as a function of their size. So you can basically see here that their smaller size bodies are the ones that are most abundant of those that have been detected. And it's much more so than larger Jupiter or larger sized. But beyond that, we can see that this, but here the Neptune sized objects are actually the most abundant. So this is meaningful because it means that we can not only understand exoplanets by looking at our own solar system, but we can conversely take that and learn about our own solar system by studying exoplanets. So as I mentioned, I want to take a broad view of the ice giant system. So I'm going to include both the planet itself, looking at the interiors, magnetic fields, including the intrinsic magnetic dynamo and the magnetosphere and heat flow and atmospheric dynamics, and then also go outside the planet and consider the rings, satellites, and formation processes. So starting with the internal structure, I'm first comparing them against the better known um, gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. We have much better constraints on those. And what you're basically going to see here is that they have really radically different internal structures. So Jupiter and Saturn, you have this large outer envelope of molecular hydrogen and atomic helium. Below that, these planets are so large that you can have the hydrogen metallicize, and then they likely have a diffuse core that's not shown in this schematic. Uh, Uranus and Neptune also have an outer envelope that has a lot of hydrogen and helium, but there's also a lot of higher uh, mass components such as methane in this outer envelope. And as you go deeper into the planets, you actually have a much more water-rich interior. So the, here you have an ionized fluid water layer that has also some things like ammonia and methane dissolved within it. And then we potentially have a central rocky iron or rocky core at the, the center of the planets as well. But I should mention that the internal structures of the ice giants are not well constrained at all. There's actually not a single model out there that's able to explain the gravity measurements and the heat flow observations simultaneously without making ad hoc assumptions. So there's lots of questions about what is going on beneath the surface of these satellites. And I'm showing a schematic here that kind of illustrates some of these uncertainties. And some of the questions are, is there going to be distinct compositional boundaries within the icy giants, or is there going to be a more continuous evolution between these different types of materials? And then conversely to that, we also want to understand if the planets are fully adiabatic. So does that mean that this whole planet is convecting? Or could there potentially be layers of stable stratification within these bodies? And depending on how heat flow is being released in these bodies, that will have really significant consequences for what their internal dynamics would be. So that basically leads to questions of what are the flow characteristics in the deep interior? What's the turbulence like? Is there going to be deep zonal flows? What are the meridional overturning circulations? So there's big questions about what's going on in the deep interior, not in terms of just the internal structure, but the composition and the dynamics um, as well. 
So when you think about the internal structure, this has big implications for its magnetic field, which is likely driven by a dynamo. So that's basically a way of creating magnetic field through the conversion of kinetic energy associated with convection into magnetic energy. And this is thought to be generated in the ionic oceans of Uranus and Neptune. And when you look at the magnetic field measurements, which is what I show here, this is the radial magnetic field component at the surfaces of Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And when you look at these comparatively, you see that Uranus and Neptune look radically different than the magnetic fields of the other um, planetary um, bodies in our solar system. And particularly, you see that this is multipolar, so you don't just have a simple dipole. It's also not axisymmetric, so that leads to a much more spatially complicated um, field structure. And then that again leads to many of these questions, which is what does a um, more detailed characterization of these magnetic fields look like? So here we're only able to resolve the largest magnetic field structures. So if we're able to go again and get more data, how much more fine scale structure would we see in these different types of maps? And also, when we do these magnetic field measurements from Voyager, that was like 30-some years ago. So then you also wonder, is there going to be temporal changes in the magnetic fields that have occurred since then? So we really want to have an understanding of what this secular variation, if it has occurred, could tell us about what the internal structure and the internal dynamics of the interiors would be. So the um, complicated intrinsic magnetic fields combined with the large rotational tilts of Uranus and Neptune lead to really exotic magnetospheres as well. So that's what I'm representing in these couple of schematics where you basically have unique magnetosphere configurations with respect to the solar wind. So in some cases you have the solar wind that kind of impinges on the magnetosphere where you have the pole aligned and it looks kind of like an Earth-like configuration. But in contrast, you can instead have a case where the solar wind impinges more towards the magnetic pole. In that case, you have a much more different behavior than um, you would have in like the Earth type of scenario. And this model shown here for Uranus kind of illustrates this change in magnetic structure depending on how the solar wind is oriented with respect to the internal magnetic field um, signature. So then this leads to, again, some more questions, as we'll find is the theme of my talk, is there's many questions. And that's basically how does this coupled system work in terms of the solar wind, the magnetosphere, and the ionosphere, and even how does this whole system interact with the rings and satellites beyond that? And how does it evolve on different timescales in terms of hourly timescales on Uranus, decadal timescales, you know, multi-decadal time scales for Neptune. So how does this work temporally, spatially, and those different types of aspects? And then not just looking at that, what are the different sources and sinks of plasma? How is it transported and accelerated throughout the system? So kind of returning into the planet, another aspect that has um, links to the internal structure and especially to the thermal structure of the ice giants is heat flow. So Uranus and Neptune have anomalous heat flows, especially compared to, again, Jupiter and Saturn. And this is, um, relates to how much heat is either received from insulation versus how much is um, internally generated through like gravitational con um, con concentration. So both planets actually emit about the same amount of heat in total, but it has radically different relative fractions in terms of how much it emits, re-emits after it's um, been absorbed through insulation or how much of it is in generated internally. So Uranus actually approximately emits the same amount of heat it receives from the sun. So that implies that its internal heat source is relatively small, at least that that is emitted and observable is relatively small. And on the other hand, Neptune has much weaker insulation because it's further out in the solar system, but that is compensated by a much larger internal heat flux signature. So that is um, both smaller and larger for Uranus and Neptune respectively than both Jupiter and Saturn. Okay. So this leads to some additional questions such as what is the origin of this heat flow difference? Does it originate in the deep interior? Does it originate in the atmosphere? Are they variable in time? Are they variable in, in spatial dimensions? And then why does this happen? Looking to the atmosphere, here is a 
kind of array of different um, telescope observations at different wavelengths that show that you have lots of different varying dynamics in terms of zona winds. You have large storms and small storms and um, some hot spots in some cases. And then this leads to the question of what are the 3D circulations for these planets, both in terms of zonally and also as a function of depth. Merniano circulations are really poorly constrained, so that is especially of interest. And we also want to understand why the storm behaviors are different. Uranus is rather quiescent and active, than active, and then Neptune is pretty much can actively, can continuously active. And moving on to the rings and satellites, these are again different from Jupiter and Saturn. Uranus has tightly confined rings and many, many small satellites. Neptune instead has less rings, but they have lots of clumps that evolve over decadal time scales. So in general, what processes control these ring structures, their evolution, their dynamics, their variability, and why are they different between each other and also compared to the gas giants? And then also, what's the inventory of small satellites and what's their origins and their histories? There are um, five major satellites for Uranus versus only one for Neptune. And the, small, the, the, the satellites for the Uranus system have lots of endogenic activity, and they're very widely varied across the system, whereas the Neptunian satellite Triton is potentially a captured Kuiper Belt object that is unique in that it has a thin atmosphere, it has active geysers that release nitrogen from the surface, and it also has unusual surface geology like um, cantaloupe terrains. So again, this leads to many questions. We are only able to observe one side of these satellites just because we did a single flyby of these um, systems. So there's lots of questions about what the global distribution of, say, surface composition or their surface geology and what causes those distributions. Um, and we also want to have a better understanding of Triton's atmosphere and plumes and their internal structures and could there potentially be oceans within these worlds. And we've heard a little bit about formation already, so I'll go through this rather quickly. Just the fact that composition and formation are strongly linked, but if you look at the um, protosolar elements, we only have one observation, and that makes distinguishing between different formation mechanisms rather challenging. So that's a big question of how and where did ice giants form, and what we can we use from exosolar planets to learn about them. And we can kind of summarize all of these different questions into different science priorities that link to the internal structure of a planet, both the bulk composition, in terms of the atmosphere and interior, we want to learn about the dynamo and the dynamics and the heat flow. Rings, we want to have both the understanding of the set of the rings, the small satellites and the large satellites, both in terms of geology, geophysics, and geochemistry, and also the magnetosphere and how that evolves with the system. And then you can also ask the question of Uranus or Neptune, and I would say that they are equal scientifically, but they're very different. So you can learn things about one that you can't learn from the other and vice versa. And I will just conclude that we've learned a lot about ice giant systems, but there are still many discoveries awaiting a new mission to the ice giant systems. have time for one question, if somebody would like. Oh, Jim Lyons, ASU. I, you didn't mention the fact that Uranus is tilted. Right, yeah, could Uranus. That, could that possibly be uh, related to the heat flow difference between the two objects? That is one of the ideas that has been put forward to explain the interior um, for, in terms of the, the weird heat flow. So that's just one possibility, and that could potentially explain um, some other kind of quirks about the, the systems as well, but it also kind of complicates the formation mechanisms. So it's, I think, still open, but definitely plays a role. Okay, thank All right, you. thank you. All right, we have come to the finale. Um, final talk will be given by Cruikshank, Stern, Weaver, Olkin, Young, um, Aniko, and Baganal. 50 years of exploring Pluto, from telescopes to the New Horizon mission, Dale Cruikshank is the speaker. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for sticking it out. I think I'd like to acknowledge the, the good judgment of the program committee by saving the, la the best planet for last. <laughs> this is a very sweeping review of 50 years of studying Pluto, and essentially all that we know about Pluto has happened in a time span of somewhat less than 50 years, and it ranges from telescopes to the New Horizons mission.
Lowell Observatory is the institution that's most associated with the discovery of Pluto. And uh, the first search began by Percival Lowell in 1905, was quickly abandoned, but then regenerated, uh, and eventually in 1930 uh, revealed the existence of uh, Lowell's trans-Neptunian planet. Just very briefly, Lowell uh, was trying to resurrect his reputation, which was sadly damaged by his uh, canals on Mars theories. But after a, a period of depression, we're told, of a few years, he re-entered the field by predicting the presence of a trans-Neptunian planet and initiated the searches. He did not live to see the discovery of Pluto, which was accomplished in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh in February of 1930. The announcement was made in March in the New York Times, and I've circled a couple of things, just one to, sh oops, sorry, to show that, um, seem to be going backward, there we are. Uh, the date of announcement was March 14th in 1930, and in the front page, it was suggested that Pluto might even be larger than Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> so it would have been an amazing discovery if, uh, if that had panned out. This on the right is the, the astrograph that uh, Clyde Tombaugh used in his uh, discovery work. So moving on. After that discovery, there was a, a long period of almost no activity. However, in, 19, in the mid-1950s, uh, Gerard Kuiper uh, was trying to understand the origin of the solar system, and it was his view that Pluto, in fact, was an escaped satellite of Neptune. It wasn't an original idea with him, but he uh, promoted that. And Kuiper was quite prescient, really, about his thinking on what Pluto would be like if one could go there. And I won't go into detail, but he largely got it right. Um, there were other uh, milestones along the way. This doesn't capture all of them, but uh, in 1976, we found evidence that there is methane frost on the surface of Pluto, and that then gave a whole new perspective on the dimensions of the object, and, uh, because prior to that, we didn't know the albedo, and so we couldn't even make an estimate of its size that was reasonable. Measurements had really largely failed. And then in, uh, just two years later, James Christie found the, uh, the large satellite known as Charon. A few years after that, the Pluto-Charon mutual, mutual events, which are mutual transits and occultations, occurred over a period of about five years. And it was with the data, photometric data, uh, from those events observed from Earth that we determined the dimensions and, and the orbital characteristics of the satellite around the planet and so on. Then in 1988, James Elliott and Robert Millis, working with separate groups, discovered the atmosphere of Pluto. The year following this, NASA began to take the concept of a, of a mission to Pluto seriously, having talked about it at, at some uh, length in a planning document. And in 1998, or 1989, uh, Alan Stern made an approach to NASA headquarters and got the ball rolling uh, for an eventual mission to Pluto which became the New Horizons mission that I'll get to in a moment. Uh, there was the discovery of nitrogen and CO2 ice, or CO ices on the surface that uh, was accomplished in 1993. And then there wasn't a whole lot of progress until we got to the mission, which was launched in 2006. The buildup to the New Horizons mission decisions, counter decisions, and so on, the entire fascinating story is told in authoritative detail in the book by Alan Stern and, um, and Grinspoon, which I hi highly recommend as a, a, as a great adventure story with an enormously happy ending. So anyway, <laughs> the launch was in 2006. In nine and a half years, we actually arrived at the planet Pluto. And I do refer to it as a planet, by the way. It's a, a preference of mine. But anyway, you may take issue with that. In any event, uh, when we got to Pluto, the trajectory past the planet at a at a uh, velocity of nearly 14 kilometers a second, is shown by the yellow line here. We approached it basically like a bullseye, made the closest approach to the planet here at a distance of about 10,000, no, about 12,500 12, kilometers. And then not long after that, about an hour or so, went through the shadow of Pluto, which gave an occultation of the, of sun, of the sun and the Earth as seen from the spacecraft and then an hour and a half after that, we went through this shadow of Charon. And this gave unprecedented opportunities 
to uh, explore the atmospheres and the, the near surface environments of those two objects. This is a, a, a cute illustration, I think, that, illust that gives us an idea of just how much we gained in just in spatial perception of Pluto compared to the best um, available image of Pluto taken with the Hubble Space Telescope over here on the left and a pixelated, diffused image of the Earth at essentially the same scale, the same resolution, I should say, and the difference that the, a close-up look can make. Well, when we got to Pluto, uh, I, I can say quite honestly that the entire team and the public were really quite astonished at what was found. What had been predicted by some to be a fairly bland, um, ordinary kind of icy object in the distance was uh, revealed as an enormously complex, enormously interested, interesting and detailed uh, new world in the solar system. We found ancient craters, active glaciers, and a convecting glacial basin. We found floating icebergs in that glacial basin, tectonic troughs indicating uh, fractures of the crust, uh, dissected terrains which indicate a, a landscape evolution on a grand scale and on a small scale, Cryo cryovolcanic structures which are still being explored and we're still trying to understand, and flow channels indicating mass movement on the surface of Pluto and some of which appears to be, in fact, quite recent and ongoing at the moment. This allowed the construction of a rudimentary geological map, which shows an enormous range of structures, terrains, and uh, features that uh, we're still exploring and will be for quite some time to come. But in a sense, the, the, the gem of this uh, geological exploration of Pluto, which I remind you is only one hemisphere, we, there's still an entire hemisphere of Pluto to go, but we'll get back to that very briefly later. Uh, the gem is really this uh, uh, larger than Texas sized area called Sputnik Planitia. And it is in fact a, a, a nitrogen ice glacier in a gigantic basin, presumed to be an impact basin, almost certainly is. And flowing into that from the highlands on the margins are active glaciers that you can see in the places that I've indicated with arrows, and then there are other features all along the way that also show up under close scrutiny. The thick layer of nitrogen, maybe a few kilometers thick, uh, is convecting slowly. Some heat source below is keeping it moving in what's called a sluggish lid convective pattern. And you can see, in fact, the convection patterns shown in this uh, contrasty view over here. And these convection cells overturn in a very long time, uh, well, mil a million or so years, and there are no impact craters detected on the surface of this structure at all. So this gives an idea of its youth, relative youth, as well as some idea of the uh, paucity of impact doors in that part of the solar system. But that discussion of that uh, structure could go on and is going on um, among people who are trying to pan out the, uh, the great details. One of the important parts of this, though, is that the presumption is that Sputnik Planitia, the impact basin in which it is formed, ultimately produced a gravity anomaly which reoriented the planet Pluto with its large satellite, such, as, such that the, uh, the Sputnik Planitia is exactly antipodal to the, uh, uh, the satellite on the other side of the planet. So again, a lot to be concerned with. We find uh, tectonic structures at various places along the, uh, the uh, margins of Sputnik Planitia. And in the walls of these graben troughs, we find layering, which indicates changes in, in, the, uh, in the depositional uh, properties and uh, processes that have gone on over uh, Pluto's lifetime. And there are some jumbled blocks of water ice that are floating in this nitrogen sea near the margins, and we find layers in, the, uh, in those blocks as well. So the history of Pluto is really written in these layers, and someday we would love to go back and uh, sort that out. More details along the margin of Sputnik Planitia, flow channels, a dry lake here that's about 30 kilometers across, and other structures. Here you can see the convective cells very nicely as well. I have to go quite quickly, uh, but uh, one of my current favorites is the potential for uh, revealing fairly recent 
cryovolcanism on Pluto in a region of tectonic stress, again on the margin of Sputnik Planitia, in a place where we see some evidence for the explosive ejection of material, water ice that contains uh, ammonia, as well as what we are quite confident is uh, a high concentration of organic solid material. The interiors of both Pluto and Charon are revealed here. They do have a lot of rocky material in them. Their mean densities are uh, greater than 1.7. So there's a lot of rocky material in there, even though they are clearly differentiated because there is water close to the surface. And in some cases, uh, particularly on Charon, a lot of water directly on the surface. There may have been a liquid ocean in the past. The atmosphere is explored primarily with the ALICE spectrometer, which was operating during these occultations of the sun and earth um, as, the, as the spacecraft went behind the planet and then the, uh, behind the, uh, the satellite. And so I won't go into detail about this, but this uh, investigation of the atmosphere of Pluto has resulted in uh, the uh, discovery of the distribution of various components revealed in the ultraviolet spectrometer, but with altitude and the definition then of the uh, structure of the atmosphere that you can see here with altitude, the, the abundances of the C2 hydrocarbons and nitrogen are shown uh, in these different colored things here. There are numerous precipitating species, more of that in just a second, but looking back at Pluto with the sun on the distant side, we see this beautiful halo of blue colored haze surrounding the planet. And this picture just really speaks for itself, this extraordinary landscape with as many as 20 layers of haze in the atmosphere. Haze made of particles that are, that are uh, forming by the photochemical processes and some of which then filter down to the surface and make accumulations on the surface itself. The spacecraft went through the uh, interaction region of the solar wind with Pluto and its atmosphere. And there are a lot of details on this particular issue that, uh, that have been worked out and, that, and are published in the literature and are still being explored. But just to note a couple of highlights, comparing the uh, interaction region of the solar wind with Mars and that of Pluto, we have uh, interesting differences and interesting similarities. The reaction regions are comparably, uh, comparable sizes even though Pluto itself is much smaller than Mars. And a few of the particular discoveries at Pluto were that the um, escape rate of primarily nitrogen, uh, uh, sorry, yes, primarily methane, is on the order of six times 10 to the 25 uh, molecules per second. The atmosphere is very extended because of the weaker gravity, and atmospheric loss is by genes escape rather than by the um, hydrodynamic escape that had been thought to be the case before. We know something about the surface composition, partly from ground-based spectroscopy, but also uh, compositional maps made with the uh, mapping spectrometer aboard the spacecraft. We know that, for example, there are, is nitrogen, ammonia, a recent discovery, methane, CO, water ice, and even uh, ethane, as you see along the list of, uh, the, in this list along the top. There are organic molecules that comprise a, a non-ice component of the surface. And that material is distributed in interesting ways that are still being explored. The colors of this particular image are not uh, the actual colors of the planet. But in fact, this region down here has a color very similar to these organic solids called tholins that we make in the laboratory. And so the, pre, uh, the presumption is that tholins, tholin-like materials are made both in the atmosphere of Pluto as well as on the surface by radiolysis of the ices that uh, occur there. Uh, we can make uh, composition, pardon me? Yes, compositional maps of uh, Sputnik Planitia in the light of these different element, uh, different uh, molecules. We come to the satellite and we find all this fantastic geology that's currently being explored in, in papers that have, uh, are in press or have recently been published. So there's no time to go into that, but just to note that there are four small satellites as well that uh, have given us their own uh, perspectives on this system. We have compositional information on two of those. Uh, it shows that they're made of water ice and in, uh, probably an ammonia compound as well. So the last slide then is, in fact, the legacy of New Horizons. Just to point out that it's opened a whole new frontier 
in the solar system, a third zone, and Pluto is no longer this outlier that is barely recognizable, but in fact is the most accessible large Kuiper Belt object, and it begs for a return mission, an orbiter, possibly with a lander. That, I think, is, is a, is, uh, is, it's not impossible in the next 50 years between now and LPSC 100. <laughs> And the last Thank point you. then is what we see here, the most, <laughs> the most recent discovery as we flew by uh, Ultima Thule as described on Monday morning. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any time for questions because we have to vacate this room uh, so that they can reset it. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the speakers for this session. Have a good evening.